Are you hiring? Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? With ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites with just one click. Then their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them. In fact, over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter get qualified candidates within 24 hours. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place on ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by all businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash shock. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash shock. One more time to try it for free to go to ZipRecruiter slash shock. All right, and welcome to episode number 54 of Shockwaves. I'm one of your hosts, Rob Galuzzo. I'm sitting here with Mr. Elric Kane. Hey, man, I'm in holiday mode. He You're is wearing mode. the epic most shirt You look like right Bruce now. Campbell. Yeah. Oh, good. good. Yeah. I'll take that. And you got Mama Kane's in town. Yep. That's amazing. I, yeah, I've been a lot of airport driving today. Yeah. But good, all the way from New Zealand. True story, and this will only appeal to one person out there, but uh, <laughs> I'm on my way on the, uh, in L.A. to pick up my mother coming from New Zealand, turn on the radio, and a crowded house song was on, and they are from New Zealand. And it was a little special moment for me. It's like it was meant to be. It was meant to feel. I don't yeah. even know if I can name a crowded house song. Oh, what are you talking about? Really? <laughs> oh, wait, that's okay. I know that one. Anyway. I like that one. Actually. The one that uh, Mick Garris opened the stand with. Yes. Oh, hey. that was a crowd. I thought that, wait, the stand opened with. It was opened with. Uh, don't, fear don't Fear the, the Reaper. Reaper. And then uh, episode two, I believe. He was definitely had one in there. House, I remember yeah. thinking it was really strange. Uh, wow. Yeah. Apparently, I need to brush up on my crowded house voice. Yes, <laughs> I'm I a little. So. Out of the loop here. Yeah. Uh, also with us, Rebecca McKendry. Hello. How are you? Doing well. All righty. And uh, Mr. Ryan Turk. Well, hello. How are you, sir? I'm in vacation mode. Vacation mode as also, well. Yeah. Mine's next week. People. I'm going to be coming in next week. I'm only yeah. coming in to do the show next week. Yeah. And wow, so, which is what Ryan did this well, week. Well, this yeah. is what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, so I'm rolling in in like cut off jean shorts and a crappy concert tee. Wow. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's uh, happening. thank you for tuning in. Thank you for the feedback for last week's episode. Please go to our iTunes and rate and review us. So it was worth mentioning. Yeah. Um, and we got a lot to talk about. We got a wonderful guest coming in, but we've all collectively seen a lot yeah, separately so. and together. Yeah, that's a big week. So much to talk about. Ryan, the mummy is out today. <sighs> you and I have seen this thing. I have. We've been we've been dying to talk about. I've been dying to talk about <laughs> it. And apparently, the embargo was lifted a few days ago. I have and, been seeing uh, stuff online, so looks, apparently, that embargo looks like went. The, the general consensus is the uh, same with our reaction. When disappointment. We, yeah. Can I ask you guys, because you guys have seen it, and I've been yes. reading all the things, uh, why do you think, because horror films make money, and they have these horror character properties, right? And I'm surprised that they decided to push, I mean, I get the superheroes uh, are big, I but. I think that's a misconception. If you're going to uh-huh. say why is it, because well, why push action, I guess. Everyone keeps complaining wondering. that it's more action than horror, uh-huh. and I don't know, I, it's, it's a lot of things. It's trying <laughs> to satisfy right. everybody. Yeah, it is. Now, before we start, look, R- Ryan and I are huge Universal Monster fans. Yeah. I did not go into this with the expectation of like I don't I'm not going to like this at all. I want to see monster movies. Yeah, I course, want yeah. those characters, and I want to see main... monster movies be successful at what yeah. they do, which is storytelling and character and scares and yes. fun and, and proper monster. Execution. The main character, I don't know what role she plays, but I think she is the mummy with the paint on her oh, yeah. and everything. Yeah, she's, she she's, actually she's looks nice yeah, in cool. the trailer. She, she like, looks <laughs> nice. She looks well, I mean, nice. She looks Becca. kind of terrifying. I'll say that. Okay. I was intrigued by her <laughs> presence. I just like in the trailer. She looks nice, guys. Well, let's start with the good, which is her, uh, oh, okay, that, who is Sophia Botello, yep. and she was in The Kingsman. Uh, I just, I didn't realize this. I just rewatched Star Trek Beyond. She's, Star Trek she's Beyond. the white chick that uh, is yeah. with uh, yeah. uh, Simon Pegg on the kicks, She kicks some butt in that. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, and she's she's great in The Mummy. Um, I wish she, nice. if when when she actually does stuff when she when she's actually stuff. when she's actually proactive yes and not tied up yes <laughs> uh, so where to begin because I don't want, we don't want to go too spoiler because obviously you're listening to this yeah, it's pretty it early. came out today yeah 
So you're probably still going to go see it, and that's fine well, if you want to go see yeah, it. Yeah, I think I think of what's not being clear, what what's not being made clear. So basically, the movie is about Tom Cruise, who's this globe 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 trotting <laughs> uh, adventurer, who's after artifacts and all this other kind of stuff. He accidentally releases the mummy. And because he was the one who was act- an active participant in releasing her, she's kind of put this whammy on him, this curse. Um, and as you saw in the trailer, he gets into a plane wreck and he dies. And then because of this curse, he's brought back, but for a very sinister purpose, which the mummy uh, has something in store for him. And Which so is ba- not clear at all. No, uh, no. <laughs> so basically what you have is uh, you have an, a movie about Tom Cruise running from the mummy – um, who wants him, and then he's kind of chasing this blonde girl around most of the movie that he had. When we first get into the movie, he's already had a one-night stand with her. He didn't think he would see this colleague again, but she pops up at this burial site, and he's like, oh, whoa, hey, how's it going? Uh, good to see you. And someone's like, oh, you saw each other? You, know, you guys know, know each other? And she's like, yeah, I've known him for like 15 seconds. And he's like, oh, well, well hey, you know, like, Here again, comes the I, humor. I, I, it's attacking oh, yeah. <laughs> his masculinity in this one night stand. So it kind of sets the bar, it sets the tone for the rest of the movie and what kind of jokes you're going to get. And, you know, I just, I just, it, it, it Beyond the Tom Cruise ness of it all, and I, I like Tom Cruise. The last Mission were, Impossible movie was no, they're, awesome. they're, they're, oh, yeah. he was and awesome. And I loved it. Um, no. Oh crap! The last he, one he did, Richard, where everything reset itself. Oh, Edge, 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 Edge of Tomorrow. No, he's on a good roll. Actually, these, mm-hmm. these yeah. are all great. And actually, Ryan yeah. nailed it for me. When when I was watching, I couldn't understand why he didn't work in this movie. I mm. like Tom Cruise. He's yeah. a great actor. Whatever. I couldn't put my finger on why. Like, I don't understand. And then as soon as it was over, Ryan's like, it's like he's trying really hard to be Bruce Campbell, but he's incapable of being Bruce, Bruce yeah. Campbell. Tom Cruise. No, and then no. I was like, oh, yeah. See, if that was Bruce, that would just performance in this uh, movie. Would and Brendan be Fraser's so kind of being so Bruce Campbell. do they Campbell. make yes. him kind of yeah. not silly, but no, he's, he's, he's an idiot. idiot. He's a boisterous. Oh, he is silly. Idiot. Okay. Oh, no, Tom Cruise should never play that role. No. Mm-hmm. He's a boisterous, he's, over-the-top no. idiot who just kind of stumbles his way yes. from no, scene to scene. He has to be smarter than everyone no, in the room. No, that's the, that's the first of its many, many but I think, But I think Edge of Tomorrow kind of paved the way for what this role is because in Edge of Tomorrow, he's a complete coward and uh-huh. he does coward well yeah. and so what he was trying to do was a mixture of both both hero and coward mm-hmm. and a little bit of a boisterous idiot and it's just like oh my god and when most of the movie is just about girls flocking to tom cruise and trying to get him for some plan Bless it's die. like Ugh. and then at the same time he's also fighting for he's also fighting to be part of the dark universe so you know the the <laughs> script is uh. is shoehorning ideas and shoehorning um concepts to like uh. what is to come You've got Russell Crowe playing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You've got I heard like, that so he had a lot really, of screen time. Oh yeah. He's got a ton of screen time. And it's a, a, little, a little story. more a little more than than yeah. yeah. So yeah. why do you think <laughs> that they're fighting to make this a universe and not just make it standalone movies? That is a great like question. what is the benefit of making it a <laughs> universe? Marvel. 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 Yeah. yeah, they're they're very adamant that this has to be a launching pad for it. That and that's it. You know what it is? It's I was talking to somebody about this recently because we were talking about Alien Covenant uh, at, at a party I was at, and it was just the idea that this has a writer's room, and movies shouldn't have writer's room. Yeah, that's yeah. true. You know, this, Transformers, universe, whatever. It's like you shouldn't be plotting out several movies. Just make one really great one. And, and DC then did there, the same thing initially, mm-hmm. and that's why DC was struggling too. Exactly. And, you know, and that's the irony. Go see Wonder Woman instead because right, that one's actually right. pretty mm-hmm. darn great. But um, no, it's the fact that they're, they're adopting this TV mentality. And, you know, I forgot what somebody, somebody once said to me about the Alien, about Alien Covenant. I'm like, oh, yeah, but the next one will make this one better. And I was like, no, 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 no. You shouldn't make movies yeah. because with that, like Prometheus. But the next one will make Prometheus better. And now the next Alien will make this Alien better. He's like, no, make – like Ridley Scott didn't make the first Alien nope. and say, well, this is pretty great. But when Aliens comes out, mm-hmm. let me tell you, this movie's going to be even better. Uh-huh. It's like no, stop the thinking with that mentality. Stand on its own feet for sure. And I mean, look, I hope Bride. I, I assume we'll see how it does this weekend. Yeah, Bill Condon doing Bride of Frankenstein is interesting. Yeah, yeah, Bill Condon it's a, it's doing a, it. It's a makes no-brainer. Me interested, it's yeah. a no-brainer. Yeah. I mean, like, and and and, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to read everything that I'm reading about Bride of Frankenstein because uh, Kurtzman, who is the director of this movie, is talking about how brilliant the script for Bride of Frankenstein oh, is. And I'm I like, hope. I don't... If you think Mummy works, man, yeah. uh, I don't want to read anything else about, about yeah. what you think of Bride. Hmm. But, it, you know, it's... Uh, are horror fans going to be the ones who have the biggest issue with this, do you think? No, no, no. I think a lot of people are going to have a lot of issues okay. with it. And, you know, it doesn't matter what the film does here in the States. It matters what it does internationally. Mm-hmm. And Tom Cruise is still an international superstar. So yeah, it's going to do If the well, film so. does well overseas 
overseas, really well overseas, then the dark universe continues on. But it's just a, it's just a one giant missed opportunity, you know. Yeah. They, Devin Faraci uh, had mentioned, you know, that the film is a you know a mixture of Life Force, American Werewolf in London, and Tombs of the Blind Dead, and he's correct on all points. But and that as a genre fan fun, gets you yeah. super excited. And I, I think I told Glenn McQuaid, I was like, careful, easy now, yeah. easy with those comps because. Yes, you will see them, and yes, you'll delight in seeing American Werewolf in London nods and life, especially Life Force. This is Life Force all over this movie, but it's handled, it's mishandled. You yeah. know, the, honestly, and, the American Werewolf thing I think is unforgivable. And yeah, when you see the movie, you'll understand. Yeah. Like, I, that actually angered me the most. Okay, yeah. when and I just like what you said because that's what I was going to ask. When you see this movie, you'll see. So here's my problem as a as an older film goer now yes. with so much to watch is if I'd seen this <laughs> when you guys saw it. No matter what, I was going to this. I saw the trailer, I'm in. As soon as those initial waves and like 38% on Rotten Tomatoes and I haven't heard a single person tell me, oh, you got to see it. Then you go, you start questioning your time and do you guys still go to these event movies if you hear nothing positive or do you actually stop? Because I think... I don't know if I'll at, go. No, at this know. point, I'll stop. I'll yeah, stop. I, if, if full mm-hmm. stop. If I get, if there's something that, say, for instance, and there's no yeah. world right now in which this, this occurs, I see the Transformers last night yeah, trailer, and I'm like, that. ooh, I'm down for that. Yeah, yeah there is no world. <laughs> no. no world. If someone <laughs> – Restart. If, if we started <laughs> getting – Well, no, yeah. If something <laughs> like that, yeah. you know, I, I, I will just pump the brakes and just say, mm-hmm. absolutely not. I got no time for this. I'll, watch, I'll catch it up, catch up to it later. Now – I I'm I'm going to check out Logan between uh, the time that this airs um, because I missed that in the theaters and yeah, me I'm too. kind of regretting. Missing. Missing. Yeah, me too. I missed yeah. that. Yeah. That was a great. Uh, but I, and I knew that one was going to be great. But I'm talking about these ones where it's like they're hitting that like 28, 30 percent, and you're like, so no, and you hear I, none I, of your friends being contrary. I, had I not seen it already, I would have. It would have probably dictated when I saw it. Meaning, I'd probably go catch a matinee. But yeah. it's the Mummy. It's Universal Monsters. Right. Yeah. I would have seen it this weekend, no matter what. Right. I right. had planned you to know? go see it this weekend, and you guys just kind of talked me out like now it has become a if it plays at the 99 cent theater and behind the seers in north hollywood the problem well, the, the being like a chore. i don't want a chore you know what i'm saying <laughs> yes. i don't want to go to a movie going oh it's a <laughs> chore of a movie. that well, well, still the, exists in the north irony, hollywood the irony is because wonder woman came out last week and that was a pleasant surprise right that's kind of my now it's like well go see that if you haven't seen yeah it. no i mean it makes <laughs> sense yeah. You, should, yeah you know so i don't know yeah and also just to, my mind you there are plenty of opportunities for them to use practical makeup effects and they completely toss it out the window in oh. favor of CGI. Just now, I'm not talking about just like augmentation. I'm talking about what would be a full prosthetic job on someone's face, and yeah. they chose to just Do like CGI. slather it in CGI paint. Yeah. And it's like, give me a break, That's a bummer. guys! Come mm. on, come on. Oh, and last but not least, uh, the one of one of the worst sins of in cinema these days, yeah. which I know you'll appreciate. Yeah. I think like the A team did this. Um, they give you your exposition of what yeah. the backstory is. Fine. Don't worry, you're going to see that scene at least 20 times. Uh, I've never seen a movie reuse so much footage from oh, the opening. wow. Over. Like it just repeats it back well, as know, like when, a when memory they men- thing? When they mention her knife, you. it's like, in case you didn't remember from five minutes ago, let's show you that scene again with the knife, her holding it up, because <laughs> this is important to the plot. <laughs> Don't forget this knife. Do you and think I, this I mean, maybe it's to the point. I think by the third or fourth flashback, we were yeah. like, you could hear the people in our theater just, oh. You know, I was at Phoenix Comic Con last week. We're weekend, not that dumb. Um, um, we were doing – when members. I was doing a panel, somebody actually asked me in the panel. It was like the state of horror panel that they always have us do with these things. And somebody actually said, why do they put so in so many explainers now? And I had to stop and think about what an explainer was. And then I was like, oh, oh exposition. exposition. You know what? I was going to question because you said something earlier that actually makes me think that might be why. And to Rob's point, it could be that international audience that they are trying to downplay because they know America, how you know, onto it American audiences are. Maybe they're thinking, oh, we're sending it to China. We're sending into other mass markets that aren't necessarily as visually literate. We don't know mm. with some of the culture, especially maybe China. Yeah, uh, but I, I don't know. I don't think that's – I mean, I you, you get Are they it. dictating from a room of people well, saying – Older older movies like – Raiders of the Lost Ark did not have to flash back during a, a It's know? simple, yeah. What Rob is getting at is just simple, you know, storytelling. Simple yeah. storytelling. Right, right. but if you're saying that a writer's room is creating these movies, then I could also imagine people dictating, yeah, mm. we need it to be even clearer, uh, even clearer. Yeah, even if clearer. it's a TV so show. flashbacks in there. If it's know? a TV uh, show and right. you're on your third episode, sure you'll flash back to the beginning. Because, yeah, yeah. You know, but but in you do movie, that in like five seconds in the opening scene. No, yeah, it's, it's, anyway, that's that's enough about that. I wish I, I, wish <laughs> I still wanted to see it, but I don't. I know. I'll wait till VOD. Bummer. You know? 
And and I'm really sorry. I, I'm actually curious to hear what our listeners think of it well and, then, and how it's going to play for them. I will suspend my excitement over that one and just hold for 47 meters down, <laughs> which I'm actually hearing good things about. Which technically already came out and you could, what was the, do you know this? It came out as an original. Yeah, un- yeah I, don't, I don't want to talk about it because I want the movie to actually do well because it's oh. out there. Like people can. It's find actually it. out on DVD on its original title. Are you serious? Yeah, like, and then they some people, some friends I know, bought it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yeah, it's pretty good. And for some inexplicable reason, they pulled it and now are re-releasing it under this title. That is so bizarre. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, yeah. It's um. I, I just got back from uh, seeing Guardians of the Galaxy at the uh, Pacific Glendale. He's and, on summer vacation. And uh, yes, and <laughs> they had there's 47 meters. 47 meters down ads everywhere. Like there's like a little standee where you can stand in the shark's mouth, which That's is pretty cool. fun. But it's a it's a really, really fun movie. Um, I haven't seen the trailer somehow. I've managed uh, to avoid it, which is awesome. You yeah. don't watch trailers. No, I know, but if I'm in a theater, I do. You yeah, know, you and check, I haven't seen any. You should check the movie out. Yeah, yeah it uh, looks really fun. It's um, uh, coming theatrical June 16th. Yeah, Johannes Roberts, who did... Uh, who did um, other side, other of, the side door, of the door? Yeah. Which we, we both like. Yeah. That was one yeah. I remember we both liked. Yeah, it was surprising. Yeah. And I don't just want to see it because it has sharks in it. It sure, actually sure. looks a little. Oh no, tense. Becca, you're the gonna shallows. fucking flip your shit. Okay, it's I so know good. I'm gonna flip my shit because I fucking I, love sharks. Me, who who doesn't get squeamish? I jump like I squirmed and I jumped and I actually yelped at one point. Do the sharks look good? The sharks look great. Okay, because that I, was that lost me a little bit at the end of the shallows. I was still with it because the whole time I was it's like, it's part. a fucking giant it's shark up there. Part of the but, shallows. Yeah. Check. Okay. But we should, you guys should all watch it and we'll, we'll I'll revisit it and we'll we'll discuss. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, why don't uh, you guys both saw something last night? Oh yeah, you want to get into that? Oh, uh, scream for help! I watched it as well. Becca watched it uh, remotely. Oh, yes. uh, yeah. Only one of us went to the actual triple yeah, feature. Yeah, yeah. So and, Phil Blankenship, and got home at two a.m. It was Phil Blankenship's birthday this week, uh, and at the New Bev, they basically programmed a triple feature of Nancy Drew esque thrillers. Well, they're all three teenage girls in peril without fathers. Exactly. None of the girls in yeah. these three movies have fathers. Why exactly. did Phil Blankenship? Pick this particular it's theme. Just Phil. It's know, just Phil's funny. vibe, I think. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, Isn't Father's Day coming up? Or what is, is that the Father's Day? Oh, it is. No, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it was related. I think it must just be. He just connects to fatherless teenage well, girls. Well, I had heard from a friend the reason why this was a big deal for me, and I, I, I mentioned to Becca, is like a, about a, at whatever the last Exhumed Fest in uh, New York. Uh, my friend Webb said you know, they, they watched 24 hours of movies, and he said the one that brought the house down was Scream for Help. And a friend of mine had it on Voodoo, and I was like, I should watch this. And then every time I had a chance to watch it, I just somehow didn't. Then I saw it was going to be theatrical, and I was like, oh, my God. It's like all the this stars the are aligned. Yeah. So I couldn't miss it. It's been on my calendar for like a month since with, I heard about it. With the whatever. stepfather. With stepfather, original. Which, which we'll get into a second. because that. But let's start with Scream for Help. Because Scream for Help. Yeah, this is uh, directed by Michael Winner, yes. who did uh, The Sentinel, which we all love. <laughs> Death and Wish. Death one Wish. and two. I, I, and I reach yeah, for the answer, Sentinel yeah. because the Sentinel, I think, definitely has, you know, the kind of kookiness that is demonstrated in Scream for Help. All of his films have All, that. They well, have yeah. Winner's yeah, sensibility yeah, yeah. is to make you feel uncomfortable. He knows how to direct a movie, so he always shoots a good movie. But he also is like pushes the sex into a sleazy place. <laughs> so Nasty, sleazy. weird. This movie, Scream for Help, which is in the opening two minutes of the film, <laughs> our lead actress uh, who is a teenage 17 year old girl basically just tells us, I believe my stepfather is trying to kill my mom. That's actually yeah. the opening line the, of the voiceover. movie as yeah. voiceover yeah. and then said aloud yeah. again. And then the film, <laughs> the film, um, basically unfolds with her trying to find uh, evidence that her stepfather is trying to kill her mom. And it turns out it's pretty damn easy to find evidence. Yeah, it really doesn't take long. She just kind of <laughs> no. walks in and she's like, oh, well, and there he well, is. Well, no, it does take long. It took her three days on her bike, three separate montages <laughs> no. for her to actually get to the evidence. It's no, kind of amazing. But that was different evidence. Like, I remember she yeah. just kind of walked into the bathroom and was like, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. She, she oh, there. See. Yeah, she just needed tangible evidence. But yeah. basically, she, she does discover that uh, the stepdad is a bad dude and he's aligned himself with two other miscreants who feel like they're from a knockoff of Last House on the Left. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, it becomes kind of uh, like an inv- home invasion. The last really? I thought the two invasion. miscreants felt straight out of a 1960s movie like The Sadist or something yeah. like that where they're just, <laughs> they're from the edge of town across the tracks and they live in this sweaty and squalor and they have dirty sex and they have a secret. <laughs> dirty and sex. Yeah, I mean, like, come on. Becca, it, all sex is dirty. Elric <laughs> <laughs> <Elric, laughs> and I were talking about this before the show those sex scenes were shot like, like it was a 14 year old yeah, boy who's never actually experienced it, it sex feels it's like what the he movie, thinks it's like yeah the movie's viewpoint feels like it's from a, a young person's view of what adult things are but oh, yeah. aren't really like yeah. that and so it's like a, I've never really seen a whole movie quite as but skewed also, as this perspective but not, not also just the viewpoint but also 
every fear is materialized. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> one of her best friends, we for, were in, introduced to her, is sleeping with her boyfriend. Yeah. And guess what? Three days later, she's like, I'm, I'm pregnant. pregnant. And, and, <laughs> and then like, she says, well, maybe you should get an abortion. sleeping with him, which is even more confused. Yeah, maybe yeah, but you she's should like, get maybe you should abortion. get an abortion. And then the car comes barreling down the road and takes care of that little problem. <laughs> <laughs> you're, like, you're like, whoa, holy shit. I remember turning to someone and going, holy shit, I guess you don't need that abortion. Jesus Christ. <laughs> it was like, I mean, it was pretty, it's a crazy. It's abortion but, all over the front. Of the yeah. I don't think the story matters. I think what we need to talk about here is, and, and, and we'll have slightly different readings because Becca, which is good for the listeners because Becca watched this on Voodoo, which means for most of you won't be able to see this, obviously, with the group of people from our perspective it was literally like you know probably one of the most live screenings i've seen in the new bev in terms of laughter well because every beat has humor and well, craziness that's true and, but because phil laid the groundwork ahead of yeah. time you know phil came out and he was like i want to hear you hoot and holler i yeah. want to hear you scream oh he want to hear you it laugh. wouldn't have been quiet anyway though i'm telling you like oh, that, see, that it oh, wouldn't have it's i too watched crazy, it yeah. in the privacy of my own living room no one the kids were asleep i was the only oh, one home that night to. And um, I had a completely different read because, honestly, if I had not read the write-up on Cinefamily, I'm not sure I would have even perceived it as a comedy. Right. Um, because everybody was like, oh, my God, it's hilarious. It's so comedic. And I saw it as, like, balls out crazy, but it read crazy, like, burial ground crazy for me where I'm just like, I don't have a fucking clue where this thing's going next. It's oh, just yeah. throwing well, everything on the screen. it's not meant to be funny. Yeah. <laughs> they and, didn't make a comedy. But when <laughs> it's you're just watching interpreted it, as such. When yeah. you're watching it by yourself, it's just yeah. a crazy yeah. experience and not like there was never a scene. I mean, the the... The car wreck abortion scene was definitely kind of like a, I definitely did not see that coming. It's like somebody doing like, um, you know, one of these warning about early pregnancy movies for TV, but they hired Michael Winter right off Death Wish. And you're like, I guess that's a good idea. And then he delivers this movie. Yeah, you're after, like, that's what it makes. Special. Yeah, after and, school special done by Michael Winter yeah. is good, good <laughs> times. You know? And it does feel a lot, like I even said, you know, it feels like these 1960s sleazy characters. The whole thing feels like a hygiene film or like an after school special where it seems yeah. so over the the top that you're like somebody's going to OD of drugs after one puff of pot in the next scene. You're just waiting for it to happen because it does seem that huge. The, the first words that sprang to my mind, and I think this is, will be fun for listeners to think about when you watch it, the narrative efficiency, right? So you, you, like Hitchcock, right? Rear window. The shot pulls in and it shows you a thermometer. You know it's hot. In this movie, it starts with somebody going, I'm thinking about killing my thing. And then she writes in her book, I'm thinking that my husband, and then she says, you know what? I think my stepdad's trying to kill. It is the w- least narratively him. efficient movie ever she created co- like, in the within world. Within the first five minutes, she comes comes out and says, I know you're trying to yeah, kill my yeah. mom. It, everything <laughs> it does, it then repeats like three times, and you're like, wow, they have no... It's almost... And I feel bad, because obviously Tom Holland wrote this, and the great story, of course, about this movie is that Tom Holland, when he watched it, he was like, oh, I guess I gotta start directing, because this is the biggest <laughs> piece of shit I've ever seen, <laughs> which I love. I love that it's the thing that kickstarted his directing career, in a sense, but it, it's it's so fun, though. Like, I really oh, had such a, a good time watching yeah. it that I can't... Well, a we large call- amount of boobs, which goes back to the 14-year-old exactly who we never fun. experienced well, under, sex. Not only that, you just Becca, sit there like that. That's underage boobs, Becca. Underage, underage boobs. We don't know in real uncomfortable. life, but it does yeah. make you feel a little uncomfortable. Big, no, well, because, like, she's established as a 17-year-old. She literally says yes, she died. Yes. She was 17. You're like, oh. And one of the great the loss of virginity scenes. the sex is, uh, um, right, oh, yeah, right, the right. great loss of virginity <laughs> scene where she yeah, just spends the whole something. time going, owie, oh. owie, owie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the payoff there is the blood. And you're like, uh, oh, yeah. Man, it just went there. It did. I had Josh Miller from Friday Night Fried sitting next to me. We just kept laughing because in every scene, uh, the actress, Rachel Kelly, is either running in or out of the scene. She's <laughs> always running into the scene yeah. or running out of the scene because of whatever is happening to her. It's just like, it, even if she's just like slowing down just to catch up to her mom, she's like running into the bedroom. Mom, I got to tell you something. It's like, whoa, slow down. I put a caveat. Do not watch this film alone. Yeah. I think you should bring a friend yes. over and say, watch it together. Yes, yes, Dave yes. got home when I was about halfway through, and he still didn't sit down and watch it. He would just gradually yeah. walk through the living room, and all he ever said is he would walk through and go, Electricity doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ground, yeah. ground wire doesn't. You cannot actually it's do that like with that. an electrical box. And then he would just walk back through. That's so funny. Um, he completely electricity checked the movie. The poster. But, I'm looking at the poster, and it says, "Alone and afraid." Was she imagining, or was it real? It yeah, really dispels well, that never, in the first like yeah. five there's minutes. No, no, yeah, there's the first no, yeah, five yeah. minutes. There's you know really exactly what's going on. Anyway, it's a good time. Uh, second up, you know, a few people, quite a few people left after that one. Uh, I've always been a huge fan of Stepfather, but I literally haven't seen in like 15 years. Yeah. And I convinced two people who are about to leave to stay for yeah. it. And Oren, uh, my friend Oren, was one, of it, and he was blowing away. Yeah, it still holds it's up. So every every good. couple of years, I revisit. It's, it's the only issue amazing. is the one character who's like kind of chasing him down, the brother yeah. who's in a different movie. He's like, you're in a stupid movie. You're the Scatman character, and you're terrible. But Terry. 
O'Quinn, oh, uh, we talked about this back on our performance episode of Killer oh, TV. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. now more than ever, I, I can honestly go, I might go all in and say it might be one of my maybe like top two, maybe favorite genre performances. Because yeah. at any one time, he's he's got like five or six characters in his, his head, head. And yeah. he's like trying to get straight what he's doing. And, and of course, the moment where he says, you know, who am I here? On screen in that moment, the whole play, it was like an eruption because it's so good. And he's always thinking and doing and it's mm-hmm. just that movie held up so beautifully if you've never seen it absolute you're in for a total gem that movie has not aged a second jill Sholin is still one of the like best presences because she's kind of oh, a yeah. rebel and she's she's just a great she used to come to jump cut a bit because yeah. uh, tom holland brought her over uh, i remember and oh, you wow. know what's weird about the underage teen nudity in that movie uh, in scream for she's help she's like 20 something <laughs> yeah in, real life, but. in scream for <laughs> help it felt exploitive like and there I was agree. like yeah. I, even at home i was like oh boobs there we go yeah but i remember in stepfather it was very kind of creepy and almost voyeuristic yeah it's only like, one it's scene towards the end it, it, it's a little weird because she isn't been p- portrayed as a sex object. That's probably the movie. why it feels more voyeuristic. And it's not about a stepfather who's. It's not incestual. It's not the cool thing about. That's one of the things I like about. It. It's never about oh a bad guy who wants to sleep with his kid. It's never that. It's about a guy. It's a you know it's a serial killer who needs the fantasy of a family. And then he when it goes wrong he eliminates them and moves to the next. And before he eliminates them, he sets up the next one. That's what I love about it. He has yeah. to leave his job, set up the next place mm. he's going to go. It's such a fascinating uh, story setup, really. Yeah. Uh, Very but, loosely based on truth. Too. Yeah, mm-hmm. Donald Lee Westlake is the screenwriter, too, and he wrote a lot of true crime stuff and uh, noir. Uh, but it's what's interesting is when they go there in the nudity, it feels really strange because it is Jill Shaw, and you're like, I don't, I didn't feel completely comfortable about it <laughs> because she is so likable, and suddenly she's just taking off her clothes, getting a shower in the last, like, 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. So it's one thing to have nudity early on where you're titillating at the end you're like why is she like that but you know it does add to the her vulnerability anyway that movie is complete gold the last one i probably could have left before the last one it's called uh it's by and but i'm a huge gary sherman fan vice squad poltergeist three uh death line uh, yeah death line is coming out out on on blu-ray and i got a sneak peek at it and it looks great see this one i'd never even heard of so that was part of my reasoning like okay i'll stay and i'm glad i did in the sense that it really kind of tells you that these are three of the same movies through different filters. Like, yeah. the storyline was the same. The girl, the, they're all TV actors that I recognize. Like, the main girl, I can't remember from, like, 80s TV. Yeah. I uh, really liked it. I Wait, just what was the name of the third that, one? Uh, Lisa. 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 I wasn't super engaged until, like, the last 20 minutes, and the last 20 minutes is totally bonkers, and anyone wants to see a violent maneuver that you've never seen in a movie, everyone said the same thing after, is that, like, I've never seen that before, and I do not want to ruin it for you because it's so silly, uh, but it's kind of amazing. The guy is kind of a generic American psycho ripoff character, so it's a little, you know, he, pro- he might have even read the book before that i assume the book came out before this movie uh it, but it, it's fun but in the context of phil's triple feature it, it was awesome because of the way they all kind of shade each other it, yeah. it's just weird though because that one's probably the hardest to get through so to play it last year a little i was a little tired but seeing these three movies together it was, it was a blast you know and it's and it's again it's a testament to uh like movie theaters where you can get a bunch of people together and make them watch something crazy like this you know yeah. Nice. So there you go. Scream for help, stepfather, and Lisa. Yep. Nice. All Some right. gems. Becca? There. So I spent most of my week, I did watch Scream for Help, but I spent a significant amount of my week watching The Keepers. Mm-hmm. Um, which You're not is, done yet, or you are? I have one episode okay. to go, so no one blow the ending. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it has been intense, where after the yeah. first episode, I seriously had to stop and go, I don't know if I can keep watching this. Mm. Um, like, it really affected I, I, I me. I felt like after two, I think as a parent the, yeah, of the any second kind, episode you have no choice. Yeah. yeah. I feel like like everyone should have to. Uh, that was my tweet joke after everyone was freaking out about Wonder Woman, the girls, own, the, the woman only screenings. I tweeted, "Hey, I think all men should be forced to, into a theater to have to watch The Keepers. Mm-hmm. Maybe then we won't actually rape and molest people. You know what I mean? Let's let's actually force people into a room for a change. And not to be like sounds crazy, but it's true. Like I think if you're forced to watch stuff like that, there's no way you could. Those thoughts could be. Yes, you know. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's just it was, upsetting. The first episode was haunting. And I made the mistake of like, it was 11 o'clock on like, I think it was last Wednesday night after I, yeah, because we got out of the show early last Wednesday night. And I went home and I was like, Every, they were all talking about this. It's 11 o'clock. I'll put one on. So I only had time for the one episode. And at midnight, I was like, I can't fucking go to sleep. This mm. is, and it like haunted me. And then the next night, um, after it kind of got out of the atrocities that he committed and got into more of the crime stuff. Yeah, don't say anything who yeah. or what. Yeah. Yeah. Keep I, it I'll figures. keep all that, mom. Um, but after it got out of the atrocities and more into like the crime stuff and who knew what and where they were, then I was able to kind of binge mm. watch it a little bit more and consume it um, a little bit more quickly. But man, that first episode was rough. Yeah. yeah. It's just crazy that people take advantage of people in this world. And yeah. yeah. I mean, to give it context, because Elric and I mentioned it 
previously, but it's you know it's, it revolves around the unsolved murder of a, a nun, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and kind of the conspiracy around all that. It's like it reminds me in a sense of a documentary version of things like Shit Town and Serial, in the mm. way that you they hook you with one part of a story, but mm. then it's actually a very different story, oh, yeah. yeah. And that's been very common in these big podcasts lately. So it was interesting to see a, a show do it, yeah. Uh, so. And it's a very visually uh, rich show, yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Cool, yeah. A lot yeah. of people have been talking about it online who yeah. from us plugging it as well. And but. I think that you were right. I said this on the, the Shockwaves um, club, but it's for me, this was like a 100% validation of pure evil. Like I always like to think oh, yeah. Yeah. that, <laughs> you know, we are our own creation and some people are, you know, you make your own decisions and if you're deciding to be evil, that's a choice. But I left this going, oh no, that man was pure evil. Yeah, I mean, I still quit. I don't, it didn't like solidify in my, it made, still, it made me question that I believe that it doesn't exist. It made me go like, I don't know after this because mm-hmm. it's just, just you don't know where these things come from. Like I remember, you know, you hear about these things, why people have desires, just like we have a desire for the type you go for. Yeah. Somebody has that same kind of desire to dominate and hurt. And it's such a, it, it, that's what a psychopath, you know, more or less. And that's a really hard thing to grapple with because there's no easy answer to it. Even psychiatrists have no real fundamental clue. So there's that little gray area of way, maybe there is something else mm. to all this. And it's, it's why probably horror films have been engaging in that for years. No, I mean, wait, do you think he was a psychopath or a sociopath? Uh, I don't know. We, we should probably save it till everyone's yeah, talked about okay. it. Yeah, okay. It would be hard to analyze without spo- being... Well, a so. psychopath knows he's... Or, uh, does what he does but doesn't think it's wrong and a sociopath knows he's doing wrong but doesn't care. Yeah. That one. That yeah, one. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Far. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Interesting. I want to have a psychological discussion about this movie yeah, after yeah, more yeah. people have seen it or yeah. TV series. But it's not even just about the person. It's about the thing behind the person. Yeah. The institutions and power. It, oh, yeah. It's disgusting. Yeah, it's yeah that's what's interesting about it. Everything. Yeah. 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 That's what will get you more upset than the person, I think, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Anyway, more Ryan. On that later. Well, that was a bummer segue. Yeah. Uh, sorry. sorry. Go, Ryan. That, the news, that's in, that in the news business is like coming off a puppy story and then moving <laughs> right into a like a a, a double murder <laughs> um, in the news biz. Uh, I watched Silent Hill, Christoph Gans's film from oh. 2006. Uh, it's been 11 years since yeah. it came out. I haven't seen it in uh-huh. 11 years. Um, and recently, Faculty of Horror, shout out to them, did an analysis of both Resident Evil and Silent Hill. And it was based on that episode that I said, you know what? I'm going to give Silent Hill a revisit. Um, I think my opinion has improved a little bit uh, on the film over the last decade. Uh, but I still don't think it's a very good film. <laughs> I think it's highly problematic in terms of its story structure and yeah. its momentum it's visually um, interesting without having visually, a story that drives I, things i've always called it you know yeah. the kind of lucio fulci movie that yeah. lucio would have done if he was still around today yeah. you know uh complete nightmare logic bizarre images and um and highly gory mm-hmm. uh, especially in the last act but uh yeah it's it's, it's an interesting movie just it, the movie you guys don't know it's just about rada mitchell who is taking her uh, adopted daughter to the town of Silent Hill because the girl sleepwalks and is having these really vivid dreams about uh, Silent Hill. And what she uncovers is this kind of town secret in Silent Hill that involves witchcraft and a uh, witchcraft, a cult, and a burned little girl who was <clears throat> basically accused of witchery. Mm. And... Um, and so through that, the town is under this curse and, you know, it's kind of like the ash from uh, the coal fires that are burning underneath the town are like sending ash into the air, giving it this very kind of snowy appearance. But every once in a while, uh, the town kind of gets thrown into this alternate dimension that's very rust-like and red and vivid and just very weird. And that's when all these creatures come out, like these burned up children and pyramid head and da 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 but you know, I mean, it's 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 an interesting movie because uh, seeing that get made ten years ago at Sony of all places, with the very beautiful score that it has, Christoph Gans, who was coming off of Brotherhood of the Wolf, yeah, really yeah. Um, you know, a cast of not, I mean, it's it's Sean Bean and Rada Mitchell, and you know, it, it was interesting. It's an interesting movie. Uh, if you've never seen it, I recommend just checking it out. It, Which it, do you it, prefer, like, re- re- the first Resident Evil or Silent Hill? First Resident Evil. Yeah, me too. Yeah, just because it's got more momentum, more momentum to it. It's fun. And, yeah, and it's I, fun. I agree. I shit you not. I mean, like, Silent Hill, I still had the same problems where it leads you on. First 30 minutes, I'm in. As soon as she gets to the town, she's walking around. She's just observing, not participating. Um, I just start to tune out. And it's yeah. not until, uh, uh, da, 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 what's her face? 
I'm blanking on her name. You Alice love her. Creek. Alice Creek. One of my favorite actors. Yeah, one of your yeah. favorites. Uh, She's it's just not until sleepwalkers, she, baby. McCarran. It's not until she comes into play, which is very late in the movie, with the cult and this kind of like witchcraft secret thing that's going on. That it becomes a lot more interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And, uh, yeah. And then it's also, like, laden with too much CGI A stuff. lot yeah. of CGI. That's oh, all that's I can remember bummer. from yeah. it was, I liked parts of it, but there was a lot of CGI. Yeah. But, I mean, in terms of what Faculty of Horror was talking about, which was, you know, themes of duality and motherhood and all that stuff, I completely agree with uh, what the two hosts discussed. I just disagree in terms of, like, the quality of the film yeah, itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wish it would be better. I-, I wish it was better. You know, it- Silent Hill has such a rich mythology that you could play with. And to kind of lean into, oh, there's this weird, I mean, I don't know if that, this is the same way in the game. I haven't played the game in years and years and years. I lived on that game in college. Was there a cult and witchcraft involved? I don't recall that. Yeah, I don't um, remember either. Yeah. I just feel I like mean, it was like you just spend a device most of it they, yeah. wandering around the town, and then at the end, I think you get to a school. That's about. Mm. I remember a lot of the minutia of the game, wow. but not the. That's over, a buzzkill too. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I just I, it's not the story that I, I expected from it. So. Yeah, I will say that um, there's a really cool story behind Silent Hill where it's based on a real town, an actual town that Dave the town and I of visited. Pennsylvania with Centralia. A, Centralia, I've been there. Yeah, but there where it's on fire. It's underneath. on fire. There's a coal seam burning underneath. Um, we actually have a really good story on it um, written by Dave on the website if you just Google like the real story behind Silent Hill and Mm. there's an episode of my other podcast Our Strange World coming up in two weeks um, where we talk about the story behind the real town. Yeah, so. coal mining town where it lit and everyone had to evacuate. Because I, I actually there's some people who really still live there. there. Yeah, um, no, there's, there's like one or two people who yeah. are holding out, but like it's creepy looking. Like when Dave and I went, most of the roads are closed down now, so there's like plants growing on them, but you'll still oh, see steam coming up. You'll still see areas where the asphalt is liquid. Yeah, there's, there's a, a lot, lot of photos of, of things uh, coming up through cracks. Mm-hmm. It was pretty. I went like 12 years ago. It was, it was pretty crazy. Yeah, place. we went because um, we used to go near it on our way because um, we would drive from Virginia up to New York City all the time and we took like a bypass one time and went over Mm. to visit it and it was eerie just because it's completely desolate but you can put your hand down and feel the heat. It's it's really intense. I will say this about Silent Hill. You know, the one thing that beyond it's very visually stimulating. What What it just needed and I think this is what I was missing last time I watched it was just like give me some more layers to Rada Mitchell's character. Mm -hmm. You know, in the first two minutes of the film, we're introduced to her, Sean Bean as her husband, and then this adopted girl. And they just want all of that emotional weight put on that scenario. Mm -hmm. Oh, they have an adopted, you know, adopted daughter who is sleepwalking and having nightmares. And like, that's not enough to like really latch onto if we're going to go on this journey. I just wish Rada, the Rada character had some more to go on. Yeah. yeah. Silent Hill. (laughs) <laughs> all righty well you you and i Elric, watched a vinegar syndrome release yes for two weeks called, in a row uh the undertaker from 1988 starring joe spinell and his final screen performance is this was this the last that's he what did? they said yeah, yeah yeah he i think he actually passed away before it was completely finished oh wow interesting well uh i'll let you take lead on this one <laughs> you know i mean the undertaker i mean it was i guess it was everything i kind of expected the, is it, it about be? the wrestler no, it's not about the rest. It's uh, it's it's basically a guy who uh, works in a mortuary home, and he uh, you know goes around picking up, or at least at one point picking up somebody, and then instantly there's not much subtle to 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 it. He t- you know takes them out the woods, strings them up, and starts cutting them up, and you know mm. kills them, and then takes them back. And it's like at times they flash like as if he's trying to create like a family of people that he talks to. The weird thing about his performance, because you know I'm I'm always the big Spinell love, yes. is there's a couple scenes where he plays it like super camp as if the character's gay like he made a choice and then the half the movie he, he definitely do doesn't it. do that <laughs> and there's a point where i'm going whoa i don't know it's definitely fits in with maniac and um the last horror movie yeah as three films about kind of the same thing you know somebody yeah, picking yeah. up women and killing them maniacs by far <laughs> the better of the three movies yeah which one has spinel like his best performance i mean maniac, no, maniac, maniac over, still no, overwhelmed those other two aren't to me like great movies by any means no. they have interesting things the undertaker has so much this it's more famous i guess for being an unfinished movie that even now i guess in this print there was two or three scenes that they had to go to the vhs elements right right there's um, and it's you know it's not that distracting at first because obviously the the the, the majority of the movies from the original elements so it looks great yeah but then it'll cut to a lost scene that's in vhs 
<clears throat> the only time I found it distracting is, uh, you know, unfortunately in the finale, there's a yeah. good chunk of the VHS stuff. Yeah, but it was the only time. way to finish the movie. Yeah, and I'd rather be able to see a movie than not see it. <clears throat> yeah. But, uh, you know, it, 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 d- it didn't offer anything. I mean, it had a couple of things that I tweeted that were hilarious. Like, it's got a woman teaching a class and you're at a school. And it's, she's just writing um, ne- necrophilia. necrophilia on the wall. <laughs> and <I'm laughs> shock. And I, 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 like, took yeah. a screen cap and I'm like, teach for America. It's like, like that it's scene very in um, Dead and Buried where she's teaching Satanism and witchcraft yeah. to her uh, students. Like, what and school she's is like, what's, what's great about that? So it, it's the T. I have yeah, a screen grab of it right on the uh, IMDb. So there's the teacher that, and that's in the beginning that's teaching necrophilia. Oh, that totally <laughs> looks like but, sixth grade English. But what I love is the boy in her class is actually Spinell's like nephew. Yeah, yeah. So he like very creepily is like, listen, I really need to talk to you about today's subject. And she's <laughs> like, listen, uh, you're cute and all, but you're my student. Blah, blah, blah. He's like, no, uh, necrophilia, it's very important that we talk later. <laughs> and so, so that's a big portion of it is he's yeah. trying to get the, I guess he's trying to confess to the teacher. He's like, I think my uncle's a weirdo. And, in that same you know. scene, I think a guy puts up his hand and goes, is this really something that happened? She goes, yes, in fact, they really believe that if they ejac- ejaculated in a corpse, it would help them in the afterlife. And you're watching, you go, oh, my God. Even just the wording of Wait, like somebody. Yeah. You guys didn't have necrophilia day in ninth no, grade? Have, I, I, that I, was I, a uh, subject in the seventh grade for me. I, I think this would probably <laughs> play a lot better with a crowd. Because, yes, Because things like that would bring the house down. Oh, my God, yeah. But, like, alone, you're like, oh, that's pretty crazy. Uh, yeah, it's, it's okay. It's I a, mean, it's, it's a passable, you know. It's just interesting. It, it's like it's almost it. like a. You guys are yeah. it. it's, it's, it's like the 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 maniac sequel we never asked. For. Yeah, <laughs> and don't need. But he's really dressed need. well. He's dressed well, and, and Joe's always fun to watch because he always thinks right. the extras are pretty good because that's a pretty. Um, well, what was I going to say? Did you? Yeah, honest conversation the, the, with the director. Yeah, the director is interviewed uh, Franco Stefan Stefanino. Yeah, which isn't his real and, name. Uh, Had it's he done other stuff? Um, I don't know, uh, but th- but I thought the most fascinating thing is like he had initially intended this to be Richard Lynch. Yeah, Richard Lynch, and uh, didn't work out at the end. which would have been far more. I mean, I I buy him as a more creepy yeah. mortician more than anything. But uh, but then I guess Spinell just really wanted to do it. You know, Spinell a, is a big horror fan, and yeah, and I think he um, you know after Maniac because Man- you know Maniac's what he's most well known for in the genre. But I think. You know, in that Just Benell story, yeah. it, it started to affect him a little that, that it upset people as much yeah, as it yeah, did. Yeah. And that's why he wanted to do Maniac, uh, Robbie, Maniac 2, which uh-huh. would have had him be more of a, a, a like a hero. Oh, okay. Kind of like an anti-hero, like killing bad people. That would have been fun. Or something like that. Yeah, there's a little bit of footage of it because uh, who shot it? It was the guy that did um, Combat Shot. Oh, okay. Buddy shot it. They never finished it. it. They shot yeah. like 20 minutes worth or something. There's a great uh, line in the documentary where uh, the – the guys hang out with Spinell and they watch a movie together and it's not a very good low budget kind of movie. Yes. And the director comes out and goes, that's a piece of shit, man. And, and Spinell goes, hey, 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 hey. You know, <laughs> like, you know, it takes just as much effort to make a really bad movie as it does a good movie. Film stock costs the same. Actors cost the same. Yeah. You might want to let up. And, and the director's like, it was a real lesson for me. Like, like the way Joe approached his craft, all movies were equal in his mind. Whether yes. he's in Godfather or, or Rocky this, this movie yeah. or The Undertaker. And I, I really like that analogy about Spinell. I always like Spinell stories. Yeah. But there was also a contrarian view to the documentary I always talk about by David Gregory, the Severin one, which <laughs> I love. Uh, which they this guy's like, they make him look down and out at the end of his life and that he's struggling and like a homeless man walking around the streets in the footage they use and he's like that wasn't the case he was he was doing great and he was had a nice apartment he was he was you know he actually so, says that footage is from his yeah, this movie the footage is from a movie taker. that they're using doc and i was like oh that's interesting i have to ask david about that next time <laughs> but hey you know that to make a documentary you have to make it engaging <laughs> so, and this sure. is the director's only film i okay. just looked at yeah and which wasn't finished so i, I don't yeah. i guess i didn't hear too much about like the, the why that was the case but anyway i mean it had a vhs release but right right come out again well that. you know you know bless vinegar syndrome yeah. for yeah, for for filling in these cracks in the, yes. uh, you know, in, in kind of lost genre cinema. So, yeah, uh, totally. Yeah, cool release. Uh, I, I watched, uh, there's, th- there's three titles I'll get to in a second, uh, but just real quick, I won't spend any time on this. I watched Get Out for the second time, uh, and cool. I hadn't seen it since theaters, and I only want to tell people because it really, it, it really is pretty much, of all the movies seen this year, the, the most radically different upon second viewing. Mm-hmm. Oh. And but almost, it still holds up, Almost equally as yeah. good, just a totally different viewpoint, and I was showing Selena for the first time, and, and she was like, you know, I was playing her like a fiddle, which I loved, but... But for me, I was like, oh, yeah, ooh, oh, cool, okay, perfect. Like, just the little hints of, of mm-hmm. you know, the seeds that were planted. It was just a really fun rewatch mm-hmm. for me. So if you haven't done it a second time, I actually really enga- uh, encourage it. Um, I watched uh, three Code Red movies that I hadn't seen before. 
uh, and uh, one's a slasher. So I thought, uh, and I'd never even. Have you guys, are you twisted nightmare people? I've never seen it, dude. Never and I was it. I went to a movie it. the other night just to look for it. And I couldn't you are going to totally dig yeah. it. It's fun. It's not essential, like you know. It, once you have seen not all the slashes, of course, is. Uh, but one of the reasons is I'm pretty sure there was a character when I heard her name called, "Hey, come here, Jenny Turk." And I was like, oh! It's a Turk? <laughs> yeah, like, a Turk no, I definitely need to see this. Uh, but it's uh, directed by Paul Hunt. Okay, so it's just really, it's just a simple setup as, as all the classic slashers. You're like at a campsite where a group of people are coming back. They haven't been there in a couple years because last time they're there, a terrible accident happened to the one hot girl's brother and he's like on fire and some flashback, whatever. A very standard. I felt the first like 30 minutes is like, okay, this is almost too routine for words, except there's a great guy with a mustache who's ridiculous. Uh, but then once it gets in, once the slasher starts happening, I, the first couple times i saw him i'm like is he a werewolf i'm like this looks crazy i couldn't tell because he's from afar he's and as it goes he looks all he's all like it's not just a burn victim whatever they've done to him he's really like a monster he looks like a fulci monster but it's a slasher version of that who moves like jason Voorhees. it's kind of fucking awesome the monster wow. character in this movie wow. uh, this. the movie's totally generic great nudity uh it's a revenge story <laughs> like i know all slasher great films nudity. kind of are I, 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 it's in my notes <laughs> uh the revenge element is much clearer like you know all all these movies are kind of revenge like jason's kind of revenge character of course but this is like a very straight revenge story uh so it kind of kills two birds but it, it's got also kind of a i'd almost like like a pretty cool score uh i don't know i think this was like a fun one to discover i, I like this more than some of the other uh you know late 80s uh slashers that i've discovered in the last year up wow. so can... especially the creature side i think you guys will dig that so a little bit better than microwave massacre uh yes well that's ours but yes 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 uh, definitely better than that one uh another one is one uh the strange Wait, that was oh okay yes that was called twisted nightmare Twisted. Okay. Yeah, yeah, true. I probably didn't even say. Uh, the other one I bought on VHS uh, from the book we always talk about, Nightmare USA, one of the great books. Oh, I love uh, that a book. book. A movie I read about like 10 years ago and never watched was The Strangeness. I got the VHS at a VHS trade a long time ago and I never watched it. I love the cover. Finally, uh, Code Red put that on Blu-ray too. Uh, and that one, uh, it says it's directed by man um, when it came out, but actually it's not. It's Her name's Melanie Ann Phillips, but at the time she used a pseudonym as a man maybe for reasons of distribution thinking that you know it, it would be a more effective way what year is this 85. and it has a female director yeah it's 85 that's kind of badass and she, it's, it's pretty it. interesting so basically uh, the movie itself is quite dull and what's funny is all of them admit to that too they all say yeah we all know this movie's kind of boring <laughs> except that if, for one it has kind of a carpenter score they were all at USC together and just as they left they're like we got to all make a movie they all banded together for no money really and they made this film it's about uh, a group of people going into uh, a coal an old mine to try to rediscover uh, uh, some film and it, it almost feels you could this is going to sound like a joke and i wish neil marshall was here for us to ask but it almost does feel kind of like the what could a prequel to that story of his could be in a really weird way Which because of, uh descent. Descent, because oh, it's wow. all because it's literally like miners go down and then they get trapped and then there's a monster the monster in this is the reason to watch this movie it is a stop motion vagina face penis monster <laughs> and i'm not kidding and even the director says what? yeah we don't know the guy the guy created it he's on camera he goes well i hadn't come out yet and i was really confused about my sexuality so i made this big penis <laughs> but wow. with a vagina mouth and i'm like yes that's exactly what you meant like that's all i could see on screen and it's awesome so the actual monster scenes aren't in it enough but it's, but it's got a couple of moments towards the end where the atmosphere is really good and i think it's a cool little movie to, if you can get the if you can watch on the blu-ray again some of the problem with some titles are you don't need to own it so it'd be nice if you could rent some of these <laughs> movies you know what i mean uh, uh but anyway i think it's i think it's an interesting curiosity but the reason it's so good the the extras on and the chapter if you've got the book they go in depth it's really about people you know, very openly talking about the process of trying to make a movie and really not knowing what the hell you're doing and with a group of people. And even if it's boring and doesn't quite work, how it can still help your career. So it's just, I think it's, they're very open. They're not saying, oh, we made some masterpiece. It's very much them just laying out like we just needed to make a movie, so we made this movie. Um, you know, which might not be the biggest selling to watch it, but I thought it was, I thought it was interesting. Oh, that is a weird-looking penis. Um... Yeah, yeah. And, and it's stop this. motion, so it's awesome. The mouth is oh. just incredible. Yeah, that's a giant monster. <laughs> Like a, and it's kind of wet and moist. It looks possession -y, <laughs> but a lot more overt. Yeah, yeah but it's cool that they did stop motion because it just adds that. Oh, cool! It's this like is a pissed off lamp <laughs> yeah. And I'm just going to go through because I want it only because I want to. There's three of them. And I'll get them out of the way. Uh, 
Uh, then I had never seen Necromancy, uh, which is total Becca movie. Like I'm literally watching I've going, never oh my seen god, ne- total Becca movie. Necromancy. Necromancy. It's, so it's Mr. Big. Everyone knows Mr. Big. Who's mm-hmm. the name? Yes. Bert E. Gordon uh, from uh, Food of the Gods and, and whatnot. Uh, this one it could totally be a sequel to Romero's Season of the Witch. It has that vibe, but it goes. You actually get more payoff of the kind of witchcraft oh, stuff. Oh, nice. It looks like that has the 70s aesthetic. It's 16 millimeter look, but it also has Orson Welles as a cult leader in this like a very later day role. Yeah, for him. he did a couple of. Like yeah, later, just, uh, like quickie. fill-in roles. Uh, there's a lot of talking about witchcraft for the first like three quarters, and that very end, you get a really cool payoff. The payoff's actually pretty interesting. Uh, it's a weird film that's always talking about the grimoire, and it's all. It's basically um, uh, who's the uh, Harry, who's not in the new Twin Peaks, but the the missing sheriff in Twin Peaks. Uh, mm-hmm. You know the main the main sheriff uh, Harry. Oh, the guy who Harry plays Harry Truman. Yeah, the Truman? actor who plays Harry Truman. Uh, I'd never seen him in an early role, so this is him, like twenty something, and, oh, him, yeah. and his, him and his wife going. He looks great. He's a he's a very good looking dude. They're moved to a town. She's having these flashes of like weird witchcraft, and they go there and find out that no one in the town except Orson is over like thirty, and you're not allowed to have kids. And suddenly, Ma- Michael kind of, Ontkin. Michael Ontkin, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, it's it's a pretty cool movie, but literally, I couldn't I, I couldn't focus on the movie because I kept just thinking of you. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm just like I'm going. Oh, I'm just watching this. I know movie. you go through that all the time. I know, I'm always just thinking about I you when I watch focus. Mr. Big movies. Uh, but it, it's pretty good. It, it, it's a little dull and in the same way that I find Season of the Witch to be a little dull but also interesting at times. Um, you know, it, it's 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 interesting. But uh, I watched these three. I was catching up. We did, uh, and I, I don't want to do much shameless promotion for the other show, Pure Cinema, but we did do uh, an episode that's going to launch in like a couple days after this. And I do want people to listen because he'll never be on our show <laughs> for reasons that don't make sense of Code Red Bill. But it's an all-in oh. all episode on Code Red will be up on Monday. And it's, you know, an hour-long interview with the recluse himself, Mr. Uh, Bill Olson. And then we... Yeah, listen to that. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. You're, <laughs> and then we count down our, you know, five movies each day. And they'll give people, like, a kind of good overview. And it's, it's an interesting portrait. The reason I think it's important is because it's so... His story and his perspective is so different than when we talk to people like Scream Factory and that because they're in a successful model that is like is a company and is a business that they have to keep going and they have rent to pay and people to pay. This is one human being running the entire company. And I mean like even the guy shipping you the DVD. So when you're pissed off because it's late, it's literally one human being doing this. So it was very – his living room, right? Lit- I mean everything. So you're like, oh, man. And so – it becomes, I'd say the interview is a pretty ne- maybe bleak portrait of <laughs> the distribution industry. Wow. But I actually walked, both me and Brian, I can honestly say both of us walked away uh, saying we actually thought he seemed like a very decent guy and like kind of a funny guy. And I could totally see why his personality would be always misinterpreted online because he, he's got the kind of that kind of self-defacing, sarcastic humor that on – if you were tweeting and texting, it would just come off as you're an asshole. Uh, and in, in the room, makes a lot of sense. in the room, we really felt that, and we felt, and we just hope that people maybe will give him maybe a little bit of a break and maybe like just worry about the movies. He's putting out cool movies. Like there's some cool movies there. Focus on the movies. I will you know? still defend Messiah of Evil. Oh, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I go crazy about that. It's one of my all-time yeah. favorite movies. Wow. But anyway, so there was a lot of that fitting. We fit in a lot of that uh, crazy stuff this week. Fair. Wow. You know, you talk about. Um, Season of the Witch, and now I have to watch Necromancy because it seems like it has kind of the same approach. Have you seen Night of the Evil, Eagle? Mm-mm, Night of the mm-mm. Eagle. Really fascinating movie. I, it was not on my list to watch this week, but I will discuss it. It's from 1961, 62, I want to mm. say. And it's about a professor um, and his wife. And his wife starts dabbling in witchcraft. And then weird shit starts mm. happening. And it kind of leaves this, like, you know, is she a witch? Is she not a witch? Um, I think. I wonder, if that, I wonder if this idea of witch, I wonder if that's emerging at the same time as, like, the feminist movement. It's yeah. like guys being scared of the empowered Could woman. Could she be a They're witch? witches, you know? But like, I always assumed that Night of the Eagle was um, a predecessor to Season of the Witch. Mm. So now I want to see where necromancy fits in. I think you'll like parts of this. Okay. And and what's cool is I I believe Arrow is putting out um, in the UK, uh, Mm. Region B version of Romero's Season of the Witch. Oh, yeah. That'd be good. Which, you know, because we can't Mm. get that one here. Yeah. Have either of you guys seen Night of the Eagle? No, no, I haven't really? even, heard, I haven't okay, even heard of that. You guys gotta title. check it out. I'm pretty sure it's on Amazon Prime streaming right now. Okay, really nice little tight. I can't. Um, I I won't say that it's you know a crazy, scary, gory horror film. I'll say it's like if Hitchcock decided to make a witch movie. Hmm. This is what you'd end up oh. with. Really good movie. All right. Oh man, so, if yeah. Hitchcock had made a witch movie, I'd be so in. I know, I know. <laughs> that sounds yeah. great. No, is it, it black and white? Because I don't want to. It is black and white. I'm out. It is black and white. Old Man Turk's gone. Um. Okay. So I was at Etheria Fest on Saturday. Oh yeah. Um. A lot of good shorts came out of that. Yeah. A lot of good shorts this year um same thing that i i usually um say when people go into etheria is and i say this for all film festivals because you're seeing shorts from all over 
you're going to see um, a $50,000 short yeah. from Ireland followed by a $500 short from America um, just because other countries have like these wonderful film programs and lottery systems. So yeah, it was the same thing again this year where I'm like, that was crazy. That's more money than I think most American horror features get made for. And then some of the smaller ones that came out of the States that, you know, still hold their own. And when I was really coming up well. in New Zealand, the, uh, I'm not even kidding, they would make about 10 a year. Hundred and fifteen thousand dollars per short. That's a feature, wow. Elric. And, yeah, and they were, and they're hardly making any features. They're making like two, you're like, and, why are you spending all this money? And on I shows? will <laughs> say, my absolute favorite one that played the festival was this one called Do No Harm, which is from New Zealand, mm-hmm. and um, and it's really simplistic in its setup, where the entire thing takes place in an operating room and like a last five seconds in the hall outside the operating room, but it has. Good digital effects where I was like, I don't know if they digitize that. It's got fight scenes. You can tell they had a choreography. Um, it's got gore. I mean, that thing easily, I, I would say, at e- least Ethereum, 20. it's such a bummer. The, uh, it's one always been one of my favorite things. I always just love going there and seeing these new visions. And the last two years, my final day of work event has been exact same time. Wow. For last, so unless it moves, I'll never, <laughs> I'll never get to um, Some see. of the other standout ones, there's one called Earworm, which is really simple. Oh, I think the whole thing's two minutes that. long. I took my mom with me to this and she was hiding her face in the program oh, your worm is definitely not for the faint of heart yeah it was it's amazing though it's, it's two horror. minutes yeah. and it's uh, just it's very cronenbergian and it's then, exactly what you think it is yeah it wasn't uh corman getting an award uh yeah, he was giving an award to he was giving an award to stephanie rothman right, who rothman. i love stephanie rothman I've seen her she, movies. yeah um terminal island yeah. is amazing she did like Code Red title. nurses you should watch if you have not seen terminal island And it's a shame because Stephanie Rothman, she kind of gets lumped into this exploitation filmmaker category Mm -hmm. because, I mean, I think that these, well, they were marketed as exploitation films. But if you watch something like Terminal Island, there is so much social messaging going on, gender messaging. There's just a lot at work there, like really complex movie. Mm. Um, I feel like that's in a lot of the prison movies from the 60s mm -hmm. of all women. Like a lot of them seem to have other themes going on, though even the ones Jack Hill was doing and stuff, they all all seem to be saying more than what you were just watching. I'll make the same defense for L. Elsa. Like, yeah. I, not okay. the last two, but the first one. Right. There's a lot of stuff going on there bigger than just, you know, Nazi with electric dildo. Yeah. Um, That's enough, though. Yeah, I know. I know. Why, why add Nazi more? With electric dildo. Um, I mean, but, Ernie's looking up at me about that comment. Yeah, yeah Ernie's enough. there. Ernie's there. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the other one, and I cannot remember the name now, but it was my favorite one of the festival um, next to Earworm, which I just love because it made me cringe and look away, and it takes a lot to do that. Um, but it was one of the sci fi shorts, and it was. Uh, I want to say South American, um, but it was two brothers who discover a wormhole in their backyard oh, yes. and start throwing toys into it. Yeah. And then they come back like 30 years later oh, cool. yeah. and it was awesome. Just such a cool it's approach fun. and setup. It's really fun. Yeah, uh, it was. They, they're basically playing ball on a rooftop and then they kick the ball and the brother comes out and he's like, where's the ball? And he's like, oh, it happened again. And he's like, what the hell? And then next thing you know, they're just shoving things in this wormhole. Chicken, you know, shoes, whatever. His turtle. Yeah, his turtle. <laughs> and then, yeah, yeah, like Becca said, 30 years later, they all they both come back. And he's like, wait for it, wait for it. And then something happens. And oh, cool. It, it confirms that the wormhole still exists. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's really smart, too, um, because the kids are doing mathematical calculations. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was like, I love these kids. <laughs> no. Yeah, so that one was a lot of fun. But in general, I always have a really good time at Etheria. And seeing Stephanie Rothman up there getting an award was just heartwarming. So. Yeah, because this was called the Viscera Film Festival, and it was an all-horror, all-woman festival. Yeah, but then they changed somebody it here to make won it all Best Director. Shiny. Oh, nice. Like three years that It wasn't was, me. It was me. Oh. I want Dunk. As, as the only woman yeah, in our Yeah, I know, room. right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I um, the Dump won Best Director in, I think it was three years ago, four years ago. Yeah, I think it was four because, yeah, it's been, well, because it's changed after yeah. that. What I was getting at is they changed it to be all genres because mm-hmm. they didn't want to limit a woman to just, mm. and I think that's a smart move because, uh, you know, even watching, hearing about the success of Wonder Woman, this is a, this is a great yeah, and start. You know? The one that actually won the Audience Choice Award was this one called Swell, mm-hmm. um, which was definitely more science fiction, where it was about this app that changes you emotionally. So it will actually make oh, yeah. a tone that will cause you to Sounds suddenly like be Mirror. happy. Or it, it's very <laughs> it's Black cool. Mirror. It, yeah, it's 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 basically a relationship drama because the two the couple get into an argument and then they start using this this app to kind of like influence their emotions and mm-hmm. stuff. It, go, it went on a little too long for my taste, but it, I thought it was a cool idea. Yeah, that won the Audience Choice Award, and um, Do No Harm, which was my favorite, yeah. won the, the Jury Award. Oh, right, right. So, yeah. Cool. 
Um, I'll just knock out the two that I, the other two that I have. I don't have much to say about them. Um, I called up to Rob and uh, revisited, I should say, Attack on Titan. Uh, I saw it the first time on a plane. Uh, I was taking an international flight, Attack on Titan, the film, part one, uh, because there are two parts, mm-hmm. um, both 90 minutes apiece. And I saw part one because my kid is an anime crazed uh, child. And she's just all up on Death Note, Tokyo Ghoul, Attack Mm. on Titan, uh, and so on and so on. So I bought her Attack on Titan, you know, the first part. Um, And like I said, I had had watched it on a plane, and I don't think it did justice just because you're watching something on a plane. So this time um, I had, you know, the fan, fangirl next to me and was kind of rolling with the emotions that she was feeling watching it because she was starting to recognize characters and recognize... at 13 years old, it's just fun watching a young cinephile grow up because she's connecting with the fandom and to see her, you know, kind of identifying the changes that they made from the anime to the live action is really fun because is she'll sci-fi? get sci-fi. What kind of genre? Attack, is Attack on Titan. It's yeah. So Attack on Titan is basically about Rob recapped it last time, but it's basically about all of these giants had had risen up on our planet and just started devouring people. And what we did in response is the remaining human race started putting themselves in these walled cities. Mm. And so what you have is um, these three walls that kind of build out from the center. So in the center of this this sit- walled city, you've got like the rich folk. The next ring is the, like the middle class. And then the outer ring is more for the soldiers. So it's and land of the dead. It's like land of the dead. Yeah, exactly. And so at the wall, the dead rules. <laughs> so the wall is to, is meant to keep these titans out. Um, we don't know much about the titans. We just know that they love to feast on humans. But one day, this colossal titan comes along, and he's the iconic titan that you see in all the advertising. He's got no skin. He's just like flat, you know, just pure muscle. He comes <laughs> he comes up over the wall. And it's just like rah! He starts roaring at everybody, and then he kicks a hole in the first wall and uh, lets all these titans in. And the titans are these naked folk. Who, I've, I've never even there. heard of these movies. Look, I'll show you photos. Yeah. They're yeah, yeah. disturbing, it's naked, amazing. disturbing naked people. Asian people with their eyes spread out. Yeah. And they have they have weird. no yeah. giants. They yeah. have no sex. They have no that yeah. no weird. like. <laughs> No nipples. I would not have ever heard of this or seen yes. anything it's, about it. It's pure insanity. Okay. And basically what it is, uh, it cuts to two years later and, um, you know, after this attack that occur- had occurred, uh, the human race has created these kind of uh, uh, Spider-Man-like mechanical devices that ride on your waist and they shoot out these cords that plow into walls and allow you to fly through the air so you can get up high enough to slice the back of the Titan's neck and bring them down, which is the only mm-hmm. way to bring them down. So I don't know about the science, the pure science of how these fucking things work. I don't even think the kid could explain it to me, mm-hmm. but uh, it's really, really unusual. Um, oh, oh, wow. just I'm watching like just total. Stuff. I will yeah. say the whole concept of it is somewhat um, pretty heavily based on Greek mythology. Yeah, yeah. I can um, see sure. that just so, from the imagery yeah. that yeah. – yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's really it's really really insane and it's the, you know, bonkers. It's yeah. bonkers. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> um, so we left off at uh, at part one. Uh, there was a big cliffhanger, but you know, as, as a horror fan, it's pretty terrifying to watch these giants pick people up and just eat huh. them. You know, I mean, like, and it does. They do it in really graphic ways. There's a great moment at the beginning of the film in which all these people decide to go into a church, and these titans just lift the roof up, and they just start eating people. And one of the main characters looks down at the ground, and from underneath the entranceway to the church, it's just a like a fucking flow of blood just yeah. plowing out into the Has street. anyone done the BFG intercut? I want to see that. Movie. <laughs> <laughs> just a, just a um, soft version. But what, what's, your, what's your kid think since she's into this? She, uh, I feel people are mixed on that like the, the she's anime. Mixed. Yeah. She's mixed. She's, so she's, she's sort of see, like the movie? She's but. sort of like the movie. Yeah, I think she likes some of the broad stroke um, tr- you know, translations that they made from you know the ideas and the concept. But there were inter-character relationships that she started calling bullshit on because they Uh. mixed up. What I didn't understand until she called attention to it is later on in the film, you start to realize that there's a core group. um, I forgot what they call it. Sorry, kiddo. Um, The the team that goes out to attack the Titans, they pair them up boy-girl, and they are meant to be 
in a relationship. Mm. And she was like, nope, that's bullshit. That kid, that guy is not supposed to be with that girl. He's supposed to be with so-and-so. And And I was like, oh, oh, okay. I didn't know that. But then I was like, so wait a minute. They're paired up boy, girl for a reason. She's like, yeah. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that either. (laughs) So there's a, there's a little lost in translation shit Mm. that's going on. But um, anyways, I I ran back to Amoeba to go by part two. And we're going to be watching that uh, this weekend. So we'll see what happens. Um, You need to give her the one that I talked about last week that is like my Total new jam, um, uh, Promise Neverland, is amazing. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, That's yeah. the one. It's about the group of kids who are in the yes. orphanage, but they discover really quickly that they are actually um, being uh, farmed. They are, it, the orphanage is a farm, which is uh, meat for monsters, well, we and went, the whole world's controlled by monsters. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll send that to her. And then we went down to Little Tokyo um, two days ago, and there was this place called uh, Jungle, and it's like an anime uh, store. And I was looking for um, Dissolving Classroom. Which is epic. And they didn't have it. I was really bummed. You can um, – there's now – you can order it off Amazon now. Yeah, um, I, that's yeah. what I might just do. Yeah, there's a really basic English translation um, now. The other film that uh, I watched and, you know, the, I think my appetite for these movies is just kind of waning as I get older. Uh, I watched this film called Don't Answer the Phone, uh, directed by Robert Hammer in 1980. I a copy of that Yeah, on my desk. it's something I picked I up at uh, Texas Fright Mare. Right mm-hmm. after you left the movie last night, yeah. they played the trailer for that. Oh, did they like, really? So you had literally walked out the door and they started playing the trailer. Oh, for wow. So it, uh, it stars it. Nicholas Worth – who um, he, he's the bald fellow you remember? He's the bald guy from Dark Man. He's also uh, the bald dude from Swamp Thing. But uh, basically, he's the Hollywood Strangler. Like he's yeah, just, yeah. that's that's basically the gist of the movie is that he's got this kind of religious. Uh, um, uh, he's got this religious fixation, and he basically goes from house to house, and he kills you know single women by taking a, a coin and. Uh, a coin that's wrapped um, in nylon stocking, and I guess the coin presses against the throat, and the mm-hmm. tighter he holds it, it crushes their throat. It's got a relentless um, vibe. It's got a rel- relentless. Yeah, it was yeah, also yeah. a trailer they show. And basically, you, there are two story threads. The one story thread, you've got the detectives chasing him down, and then you've got this uh, doctor who is also a radio DJ uh, who's kind of helping the police out in their um, – uh, investigation and you know it, there's just not much to latch on to mm. uh it's it's it, I, I can't really sell it just because it's you know it's funny to see nicholas worth hamming it up like he's a big fucking dude and there's these really tacky moments in which he's just kind of like talking to himself drunkenly um but in terms of the kind of pure fun value even if you saw it with a crowd there's not much to really get excited about Mm. so yeah it's kind of it's super sleazy um if anything i just kind of made a game out of picking out all the hollywood locations because he'll be driving down uh um ventura boulevard and the next thing you know he's down on like santa monica boulevard and you're like not possible not possible not possible um anyways don't answer the phone i know that might be some nostalgia out there for you guys but i'm not i feel like we've seen a lot of movies this week i got one more i want to throw out and i have two plugs before we wrap uh the last movie i want to talk about just because uh, i like giving a spot shining the spotlight on some of the more low budget independent films this one just came out this week and it's called aaron's blood um and uh, who put this out it's on dvd blu-ray and also i believe vod by the time you hear this uh gravitas ventures who does a few of these type mm-hmm. of films gravitas, yeah. And, uh, gravitas. yeah gravitas thank you and um it's written and directed by a guy named tommy staval who i'm not familiar with but he's done a couple of films uh one of his early ones is called hate crime which i'm sure i skipped because of that title mm-hmm. uh but this one's interesting and it's funny because it's basically a vampire movie and what's funny is I, I would say, you know, Dracula and vampirism is normally, I, I don't want to say my least favorite, but in terms of subgenres, it's not one that I'm as, as excited about in horror. However, then something like, uh, you know, Habit or Near let Dark the right or Let the Right One In, yeah. like when, I, when one of them hits. transfiguration. Yeah, exactly. When one hits, that's a little different, yeah. like Martin or so, something like that. I love them. Uh, so this is interesting that now we've had two this year, including one that Becca mentioned, The Transfiguration. And now this one's called Aaron's Blood. And what I like about it is it's a pretty simple drama about um, a single father who's raising a, a kid who has hemophilia. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, basically he's got these bullies at school that kind of pick on him. And, and there's one day where a bully's a little too rough on him and the kid won't stop bleeding. So they have to rush him to the hospital, et cetera. And while he's in the hospital, he gets a blood transfusion. And after the transfusion, uh, it's very evident that he is now a vampire. Mm. Like the blood that he got turned him into one. And what I like about it is, is it treats it very, it's just, a, it's treated as a drama. So it's pretty straight. Cause now as a, a father, and I'm sure 
I mean, I'm, I'm not a father, but I still got the emotional, you know, uh, this, behind the emotion of the story of like, well, what do you do if your kid almost died, but now he's this thing that, you know, like, how do you deal with it? Um, so, and, and the lead actor who plays the title character, Aaron, is uh, James Martinez. I'm not as familiar with him, but he does a lot of TV work. So mm. I sort of was familiar with him and he's, he's a really good, uh, he's really good in this. Um, I, I think it's worth checking out. It's only like 80 minutes long and most of it works. Uh, mm. The few little bits that I actually think were worked against it were when they tried to go for vampire horror stuff. Uh, it's actually plays much. I almost wish it stayed in that kind of Larry Fezzen habit, like will, is it or isn't right. it sort of thing. But zone. no, they do actually make it clear that there is a vampire, but any, but any time I thought I knew where it was going, they actually had some really sharp and smart twists and turns. How did it, to it come into your purview? Was it, did somebody tell you about uh, it? Honestly, <laughs> um, it was you know obviously through the website through Blumhouse dot com. We get a lot of um, you know a lot of requests to post things, and and I got the trailer, huh. and I watched it, and the trailer was like really cool. I was like, oh, I kind of like this premise. That yeah. looks like really good. So I just watched the trailer, and then decided to check out the uh, the DVD. So this one comes out this week and called sad, Aaron's Blood. And a sad connection to an earlier thing we were just talking about, which is the end of Joe Spinell, because that's how he died. Yeah, he was he he hemophiliac out as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, so... Um, <laughs> You're looking at me like I, I did wait, it. Wait, way to go. I didn't no, do it. it. You just you took it, us from our cute and cuddly cat story <laughs> to 10 dead I, on bus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's how we're rolling tonight. Uh, <laughs> can we talk about the keepers again? <laughs> I have two plugs before we uh, break All down right. here, guys. Um, first, it's not a horror film, but if you have Netflix, you need to watch Mind Horn. It was um, especially if you're a fan of Mind 70s Mind Horn. Okay. Um, it is pretty much what like um, Hot Fuzz was for 80s cops movies. Mind Horn, it's British comedy. A lot of the same people, Nick Frost is in it, Julian Barrett. Um, and it is the, the same kind of comedic parody for 70s action films like okay. Bionic Man and yeah, yeah. things like that. Absolutely hilarious. Not horror, but still definitely genre-oriented okay. and great. Um, and also I have to plug Slash, which I think Ryan went to see. Yes, it was something I wanted to discuss. Well, you know, so all, I think all three of us are, are going guys, to see it. This yeah, week. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah, I'm, I'm going to see it next Monday. We'll so, yeah, we, but I'll say yeah. in the meantime um, that Slashed, it's a musical, um, horror musical going on as part of the Fringe Fest in Los Angeles right now. They just added a couple more days. Oh, did they? Um, yeah, because it's they, sold out. Actually, yeah, it's yeah sold out. so it is worth plugging a bit because, I mean, they'll probably still sell out, but they had um, two more openings and I don't know how big the theater is because they've been selling out every show. So, mm-hmm. but if you know this is coming out Friday, so maybe we can help finish the sellout. I yeah. did the choreography for it, and it's an absolute blast. Uh, the show is is fun. And I imagine Clark, there's Clark tons Wolf of in it too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I imagine there's tons and tons of references to slash. Oh my gosh, know. some okay. are really direct from movies, uh-huh. like, and some are like winks, that, right? and okay, then cool. others are just kind of general tone. Um, but yeah. yeah, it really is Sean Keller's love letter to eighty yeah. slashers. Awesome, awesome. That's yeah. Great. And we'll all have seen it by next week. Yeah, so let's talk about that. And somebody watch Evil Ed because I want to talk about that too. I don't have a copy of that, but I've been always curious to watch that movie. We also just got a copy of Mad Man, which I've never seen. No, Wait, no, Mad House. Mad House, thank you. Uh, which I've yes. never seen before. Um, so. I just want to throw a shout out to a screening that if you're in Los Angeles, come uh, to Cine Family on June 23rd, uh, Friday Night Frights, and Blumhouse are teaming up oh. again for a Jennifer's Body screening with yeah. Karo Kusama. Nice. Um, That's going to be awesome. Basically, it's just, you know, uh, it's just my effort to just get the Blumhouse brand out there, do some fun screenings yeah. with a good team. And then um, if you guys are going to Lo-Fi Videos VHS Swap Buy or Die at Lethal Amounts this Saturday, and you see me, just say hi. I'll I was actually thinking about it because I've got of, some uh, I want to trade yeah, in. Yeah. Where is that physically? Uh, I don't it's called uh, downtown. Downtown. Downtown, downtown. Downtown, okay. Yeah. Well, I will be um, swinging into KidCon briefly on Saturday as well, which is um, yeah, Jose, Jose Prendes, Prendes friend, convention. Yeah, Jose friend of ours started a convention for kids, uh, all geek-related, and it makes a lot mm-hmm. of sense because that's something that you know is, oh, is part of horror yeah. cons we go to, but I don't know yeah. enough about it yet, but I, I might actually try to go to. We're going to try to swing by. Yeah. Um, I know during the lo-fi um, VHS swap, which I usually always go to those, I'm having my house re-guttered, which is the most like lame suburban thing I've ever said. So if you're at, um, Becca's, but... uh, if you're at Becca's re-guttering, be sure <laughs> yeah. to say hi to the Shockwaves team. Be sure to team. say hi to the Shockwaves yes. team at my house regattering, <laughs> but I'm going to try to um, at least swing by KidCon because they've got like people from Yo Gabba Gabba there. And I haven't looked at the list. Yeah, I've got to look it up. Yeah. Very so. cool. Excellent. Are you hiring? Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? With ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites with just one click. Then their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. 
it finds them. In fact, over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter get qualified candidates within 24 hours. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place on ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by all businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash shock. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash shock. One more time to try it for free to go to ZipRecruiter slash shock. Okay, and welcome back to the show. Uh, joining us for the second half of episode 54. Uh, here's the, I, I don't, I can't believe it's been this long. And we say this a lot now that we're in the, in the 50s of this episode, technically almost 200 of Killer yeah. POV. Yeah. Uh, but this is a guest that uh, we've always wanted to have on in the show. Um, and he was the uh, uh, creator of the Final Destination series, as well as writer on um a new film that's out now called Dead Awake. Mm-hmm. With the great uh, Jocelyn Donahue. Jocelyn Donahue, yeah. 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 We'll Love get to her. that. We'll get to that. Uh, and um, as well as a, a little film called Tamara. And uh, and another one that we've talked about <laughs> off record. Starring this channel. I don't want us to say it, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'll bring it up in passing just because it has an interesting backstory to a Day of the Dead. That's okay, we can and, talk and about it. And not the Romero one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome to the show, Jeffrey Reddick. Hi. Hey, I, how are you? Well, I'm up? great. Thank you guys for having me. Of course. And, uh, and you know, gals. Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. Well, I'm used here. to it. <laughs> Uh, and uh, before we dive into kind of how you got into the business and stuff, because the the backstory of Final Destination is terrific, and I just read a little something today, which I will share in the group before this episode airs, which is basically your spec script for an X Files episode, which was Final Destination. Yeah, that's absolutely. where it originated. That is amazing. Yeah, yeah, but I didn't. I never submitted it. I wrote it because at the time, if you wanted an agent, you had to write something for an original and then something for a show that was on TV. And uh, so, yeah, I wrote it as an X-Files spec, and it was Scully's brother yeah. that we never saw who had the premonition. And one of my friends at New Line, Mark Kaufman, um, was like, this is a great idea. You should actually write this as a feature. Mm-hmm. So I ended up taking it to my friend Chris Bender, who was working for Warren Zide and Craig Perry, mm-hmm. uh, the producers. Because even though I worked at the studio, I knew that it was going to be a tough sell, so I should mm-hmm. probably get some backing outside of the studio. And, yeah, we worked on the treatment. For like six months and, you know, New Line kept saying, well, we don't know how you can use death as a killer. This doesn't make any sense. And then we said, well, Craig's like, well, we're going to sell it to Miramax if you don't buy it. And they're like, well, buy it. And then <laughs> I wrote the script. <laughs> Wait, a hardball there. That's well, great. You know, that's what they do. That's yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's really, it's a really cool writing sample. Um, I think I think uh, Bloody Disgusting had shared it a couple of years yeah. ago. Yeah. So you could find it online. I'll post the link to it. But it's kind of neat. And this is the original episode spec script that you wrote. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. awesome. It's, you yeah. know, it's Mulder and Scully. And, oh, and, uh, weird. Excellent. And the, the, Scully's the, the, younger the, brother is the one that has the premonition and gets people off the huh, plane. It's really cool. But the funny thing is I I because I had to save it as another document, so I put the date wrong, like one year off. And so some of the stuff I reference in that episode didn't happen until the year after. So people were like, This is a fake script. I'm like, no, I just I had to resave right. it. And I, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And oh, those X-Files. <laughs> that very first treatment that you had done that was a spin-off from that pilot. Mm-hmm. How how different was the treatment to final final product? Um, it was quite a bit different. I mean, originally they were all adults who didn't know each other. Uh. And then Scream came out, and I love Scream, but then it's like teenage, we have, they have to be teenagers. So then they became high school students. Right. And, um, you know, the, the biggest thing, and I, and I always give credit to Wong and Morgan for this, the biggest thing was my original script was, since death didn't get them the first time, it basically had to mind F them mm-hmm. um, until they committed suicide. Mm-hmm. So it was very nightmare. It had more of a nightmare on Elm Street vibe mm-hmm. to it. Mm-hmm. And then um, James Wong is too dark for people. Which is really dark, but a really cool concept. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I still love it. I mean, it's a, I still love this, the, the original script. I mean, and we worked on it so much. And I, you know, again, I worked with, with Warren and Craig so much on the script. And then with New Line on the treatment, that by the time we got to the script phase, I mean, they went out to directors with the first draft. But this was, again, we'd worked on the treatment like 50,000 times. Sure. So, wow. Um, so when Wong and Morgan came on, they they came up with the Rube Goldberg device, which I actually I think probably gave it more legs mm-hmm. than the way I would have done. You know, visually I like my Nightmare on Elm Streety vibe to it, but I think the Rube Goldberg thing helped make it more universal. 
and maybe um, less grim for some people. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. it was because you're kind of you kind of it became a mainstream hit, whereas people like us would like your version, but you don't know if everyone would. Whereas this yeah. this kind of appealed to everyone. They were fun and, suicide. <laughs> and I do have to say, the Rube Goldberg it added um, an element of slasher where I don't think there would have been one yeah. where you're like looking yeah. forward to see how they die. Right. Um, and you know the slurpee into the tanning bed. You know you remember that moment of death or the laser eye surgery. Like you always yeah. will remember the That's way. That's my new that band they die. name, Slurpee to tanning bed. <laughs> <laughs> or like the gymnast one was always my favorite. Uh, right. well, it, death it, was the it, one it, that made yeah. me. I yeah, I was a, a screening at New Line, and yeah. that's the one that where I was. I just screamed. Is that like, five? <laughs> yeah. Number five, the last yeah. time. Yeah. That, that yeah. was really stand up and pay attention. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was instead of like the kind of POV of the killer, mm-hmm. or the, the you know the black gloved maniac. Mm-hmm. You know, you just had this. Oh, it's a it's a bowling ball that just accidentally hit the ruler. The ruler hit the window. The window smashed, and because of that, a bird flew in. And it's like, yeah. Oh my god. And dominoes, yeah, domino effect <clears throat> concept is yeah. it's pretty cool. Well, yeah. you know, and, and 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 you know, I was honest about this with Craig when he was on the show. I love the way they set those set pieces up in the first two, and definitely the last one. But there came a point where because you're three or four movies deep. Where it becomes a little little mousetrap, where it's like mm-hmm. this is going to be a very long and drawn out, like oh, coincidental yeah. things much, falling yeah. on top of each other and stuff like that. Um, but um, the thing I'm curious about is is you know kind of where your love of horror started, because one of the fun things about Final Destination, I don't, I don't know if it exactly your sound, you know, it sounded a little bit more psychological the way you were going with it, but you know, we always think like how can you redo the slasher genre? Because mm-hmm. the slasher genre is such a, a a unique formula. Right. And it's usually, you know, a serial killer that knocks off different people for whatever motivation. And to me, the closest, like, redux of it, doing it in an original way, was The Final Destination. Right? Yeah. Because it's, structurally, it's like a slasher, but yeah. there's just not a physical guy in a mask doing it. Right. And I thought that was super cool about Well, good, it. because it doesn't just make it a whodunit. Even the problem with Scream, first film, amazing. But for me, the problem as that went on is, like, I don't care about the whodunit anymore. You're just getting more increasingly absurd. Yeah. Right. But you're not w- w- thinking about that when you're watching A Final Destination. Right. You're, right. It's how done it. How, yeah. Which is cool, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. The how done it, John. <laughs> That's, you, you reinvented the how done it. <laughs> reinvented the how done it. <laughs> but because it is these kind of rule Goldberg-esque accidents, there's never even a clear who done it because it's always like, is this just, well, at least in the first one, it right. was always like, is this just coincidence? By the time it gets to the second, you're like, oh no, death is doing yeah, it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for at least the first one, I was like, ooh, they leave it ambiguous. Yeah. So, yeah. so anyway, the question was, uh, going back to the beginning, I mean, you always, were you always a big horror fan? Yeah. Was this the, the genre you embraced the most growing up and when you were becoming a creative person? Absolutely. And I think part of the reason is probably the reason most of us do is I was kind of an outcast when I was younger because I you know not to get all serious and get outish but um <laughs> it was like me my sister and two other people of color in the whole like probably 100 mile radius of where I grew up what state did you uh, grow up Kentucky, in Kentucky Eastern Kentucky Virginia okay, oh so Eastern you, Kentucky yeah my family's from Grundy down around the tip where Virginia meets Kentucky oh, okay so. didn't right. Carpenter near. come from Kentucky yeah ultimately so. yeah yeah, Carpenter's room. I forget, actually. Yeah, I, I was so traumatized when I was yeah, right there. Just, <laughs> I, I, and I love, and I actually, my mom, my family's from there, and I actually love the experience of growing up there because I think it did, it taught me a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but it definitely was, you know, it was very, the race, there was a lot of racism growing up. And so I had a click, a really tight click of friends. And it was kind of a rebellious thing. You know, we were, we were, we were watching horror movies when we were like 13. Yeah. And my mom was cool. You know, she'd let us watch them. Um, she would be like, I don't know why you want to watch that crap. But she would still let us watch them because it kept us out of trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, for my friends, it was all about the, you know, like, let's watch the, blo- find the bloodiest stuff we could find. That's all we cared about at the time. And then it was like nudity. And then it was like, <laughs> When I got to like Nightmare on Elm Street, I'm like, wow, these movies can actually be like freaking awesome and have a story <laughs> and the girls can be really smart and cool and fight. And um, then, the, yeah, I just I read Fangoria. You know, I was just a total horror geek from a very, very young age. Mm-hmm. And how early did the the writing thing start? And was that, um, was that the path you wanted to take in terms of movies? Uh, no, actually, I wanted to be a movie star. Oh, okay. I told, I told everybody, in front of the camera. I told everybody I was going to be in Team Beat and a movie star. Were you a theater um, geek? I was a theater geek. Hell yes, you yeah. were. And uh, the funny thing is I went to um, New York when I was 19. I studied at American Academy of Dramatic Arts and got an agent and all this stuff. But they, my agent finally was like, you're kind of an ethnic Michael J. Fox type, and I don't know what to, <laughs> I, I don't know what to do with you. Ethnic Michael J. Fox. You know, I love it. She was basically trying to say, you know, you're – 
too white acting for any roles of color and you're not tough enough to play, you know, any black roles or Latino. We don't know what the hell to do with you. So that's kind of, I was like, well, I'm going to start writing stuff and put myself in. It was my original goal. Um, but now I'm still writing about teenagers and, and getting too old to play a teenager. I don't think I can pull it off. <laughs> yeah. But um, acting was my original goal and love. But also English was my best subject in school. Uh-huh. So um, it kind of, they kind of merged together. Wow. What was, uh, you know, what, what kind of pushed you towards the writing thing other than trying to um, write stuff for yourself? Well, you know, actually, the funny thing is I used to, when I was young, I wrote short stories. Um, you know, I, I did when I saw Nightmare on Elm Street. I went home and, like, got on my little typewriter and clanked out a prequel <laughs> idea. Of course. Uh, <laughs> was, and, it, was it a traditional typewriter or some sort of, like, word processor? It was or, a, uh, no, it was a, <laughs> it was a typewriter like, click, with, click, onion, click, with click. onion paper yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> in the whiteout you had to put over it. And, uh, yeah, I wrote a treatment or prequel for Nightmare on Elm Street and I sent it to Bob Shea in New a York. Prequel? I like, a prequel. Oh my God. Oh my it? God. You have not heard this story. No. And I like, love that you sent it off. This is awesome. I, well, I, I got the address. I got the name of the company from the video box and I called information in New York and got the address for the company <laughs> and I mailed my prequel off to Bob Shea and he sends it back to me saying, you know, we don't take unsolicited material. So I wrote him back and I'm like, I sent it back to him and I'm like, Look, mister, I've seen three New Line movies, and I've spent $3 on your stuff. So <laughs> I think you can take five minutes and read my story. Wow. Did you tighten so, up and respond? Wow. He did. He actually wrote me back, and he's like, I appreciate your aggressive introduction. Um, <laughs> you, you've got a great imagination. He said, you know, you need to study st- structure. I mean, he gave me some really good advice, and I became friends with his assistant, Joy Mann. Um, and <laughs> wow. from age 14 to 19, I would stay in touch with them, and they would send me, like, tchotchke. I didn't know what tchotchkes were until Joy told me. You got swag. Um, yeah, I got swag, swag now. new line, and um, they would send me scripts, and I would write stuff and send it in, and, you know, they'd be like, oh, yeah, the coverage was good, but it's not right for us. And when I started working there, I dug up the coverage, and it was like, this is awful. I mean, that was, like, 15 and yeah. 16. So <laughs> they were like, this Kid is never going to write it. But they saved the coverage. I mean, like, they were obviously treating you as, like, a real screenwriter if they're actually having someone do coverage on it. Did they know your age? (laughs) No. So the house that Freddie built, built Jeffrey. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That is, um, that's a great story. Yeah. That really is a pretty. And yeah, Freddie built me. Yeah, Wes Craven. That's why, I mean. And then you kept it going. Always my favorite, is my favorite movie. It's such a, you know, yeah. Anyway, that was really sad when. When Wes passed away, yeah, um, I had the pleasure of meeting him just just once. I was too nervous. Like when we we did the documentary house that Freddie built, and and he came in to interview right after me, and I was just too like I'm like 35 at the time or something like that. And I'm just <laughs> yeah. like I can't talk to Wes Craven. I was just like <laughs> too starstruck. And that's how I was when I met him. Where he was in Jump Cut one day, yeah, and he was eating a chicken sandwich, and I literally walked over and was like, "Hi, I'm Becca." Fangoria, and then as soon as I introduced myself, I was like, "He thinks I'm paparazzi." And then just I, like, for the record, it was out. tuna. It was tuna. Yeah. Thank I you. Remember, I remember it like yeah. it was yesterday. And Becca actually walked over and said, "Can I have some of those fries?" Yeah. I want some of those fries. They don't serve fries at Jump Cut. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. funny. Yeah, everyone with him, they always talk about how, how what a great sense of humor, you know, like everyone. And I always find that interesting because that's not necessarily the first thing that I think about when I think about his work. But yeah. definitely, anyone I've ever heard talking about him, they always say his sense of humor in person was his like, you know, amazing attribute. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. what was your first big break in the business? Because it seemed like from a young age, you were already <laughs> sending stuff to new line cinema and, and making an effort. Yeah. Um, it was funny. Cause I, I went to, I was very sneaky. I wish I was as ambitious now, but, <laughs> no, but I, I went to call, co- I had them start a theater class in my high school. And then when I went to college, I had, I had them do a summer program where I could go to New York to go to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. And then I got an internship at new line. Um, but I was, I also got an agent. So I was doing some acting and auditioning and stuff like that. And so, um, I decided not to go back to college and, uh, new joy asked me if I would wanted an internship at new line while I was, you know, auditioning. And I said, sure. So I started interning at new line when I was 19. Wow. Um, and then after the agent told me I was an ethnic Michael J. Fox and I loved Michael J. Fox, but you know, <laughs> and the Cosby show went off the air. So early nineties, what else, what are, what am I going to be on if the Cosby right. show's not on the air? <laughs> um, I'm not going to say a joke about that. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I I guess working at New Line, you know, my internship when I was 19 was kind of my big thing. I mean, acting wise, I did, I had an under five part on all my children, which was like a big deal back home. Ooh. I was like a messenger boy who delivered some very important information to uh, Jackson Montgomery. <laughs> wow. It was very cool. And what and was uh, Final Destination at the time called Flight 180? Flight 180. I remember in Fangoria, that was the original mm-hmm. title. Yeah. Was that the first thing that you wrote that got produced? That was the first thing I wrote that got produced. The first thing I wrote, and I'm hoping that I'm, I can kind of revisit this somehow, I was hired um, to write uh, Pumpkinhead 3. Oh, know? wow. Huh. And it was between me and another writer, so they had us both write drafts, and then the company went under. 
Um, this was Motion Picture Corp. Right? Now I want to read your Pumpkinhead 3 draft to <laughs> see where you pick up from Blood Wings. I, well, no, but it was actually off the original. So it was before. So you ignore Blood Wings. It was, it was um, this was back in the early 90s. This was before they did the Blood Wings and stuff. Oh, nice. So I picked up like, it was like 10 years later and it was like Bunt, the hillbilly kid that, you know, told Lance Hendrickson where uh, Pumpkinhead was. Mm-hmm. He was going back to his hometown for the summer and his friends from school went back to like surprise him. And there was an accident, and you find out, like, that Sarah, the young girl from the original, was older now. And so Haggis was trying to turn her into the next witch. And it was, it was, I really like it. So I know they're remaking it. So I'm going to be hitting Peter Block up at some point. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> just saying. <laughs> I, I just put all my shit out there. <laughs> he does listen. So he that, does. Yeah, we, we've got that going hey, for Peter you. Hey, Peter Block. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so you worked on that, but then, but, you know, how did your life change once, you know, cause it seemed like it was a little bit of a process to get from your original idea to the final yeah. feature. And then when it came out, it just became this huge, it was massive. Like, yeah, what was overnight. The, what was the, yeah. What was the overall, the, that Monday morning following the box office, what were the, e- like the emails or the correspondences you were on? I mean, it was, it, it's so weird because I, I worked at the studio for so long and so it was Kind of being on the inside, it was a, it was just different. Like, I was in New York, so it was a lot different than being out in L.A. Um, so it was, everything was, like, really cool, and it was awesome. Um, but I wasn't out here to, like, do the Hollywood thing. And I never even thought – I thought I was going to do everything from New York and just stay there. So, I mean, it was really great. It was – you know, New Line wasn't sure how the movie was going to do, so they didn't put a ton of marketing money behind it. And then it, it opened, I think, at number three. But it didn't drop. Like, most horror films, like, drop 50%. And this one, like, actually started going up. Mm -hmm. And then it stayed in the top ten. I think it was in the top ten longer than any movie that came out that month. Like, it broke some, you know, Entertainment Weekly did a piece on it. They were like, wow, this movie's got legs. Um, So it was really cool, but I still stayed at New Line. Like, I didn't think about moving out to L.A. I'm like, oh, I can just do this from here. Mm. Um, There was some, you know, there was some behind-the-scenes kind of drama with the first one, you know, which was made it not as fun as it should have been, unfortunately. Mm. You know, because when you work at a studio... Um, you know, Bob Shea gave me a lot of like input as far as like rewrites and things go. And, and, um, some of that stuff wasn't related to, you know, the director. And so some, there was some miscommunication that just made some things weird at the time. Um, which I regret cause I really, I'm big fans of Wong and Morgan's both. Um, and when they first mentioned getting them, I was like, you should totally get them. They are, did some great episodes of the X-Files and stuff. So it was, it's kind of a weird vibe, but it was great to see that it did it opened at least in the top five. Mm-hmm. And then when it didn't drop, it was great. Mm. Um, and then I, you know, started thinking about, you know, the story for the sequel immediately. And it's so funny because it's weird when you, like, work at a studio. And I always have to say, like, I'm very grateful for everything. So I never, you know, I'm not, like, bitter about stuff. But it, it is funny when you work for a studio. Like, they don't, they think of you almost as an employee that, they don't think of you like, oh, he created a franchise for us. Mm-hmm. So I wrote an idea for the second one. And they literally met every horror writer in town. And they finally came back to me, and they're like, "Okay, oh, we're wow. going to take your story." <laughs> um, <laughs> wow! But um, you know, so it's it 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 was really cool. And then after I sold the second one, I decided to leave, you know, New Line and kind of start doing the writing thing mm-hmm. full time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then nine eleven happened, and so then I decided to finally move out to L.A. So it was it was an interesting, just you know, in, in retrospect, I it would have been I should have probably moved out here right after the first one and kind of taken advantage of all the all the hoopla about it, but um. You know, I lo- you know, I'm very happy with the second the second film as well. And That's a really good film. Yeah, I, I got to admit, because uh, cause the first one did great. I remember me and my friends all had a great time when it initially came out. But then I think a year and a half later, I went to a Fangory Weekend of Horrors in New York City. Mm-hmm. And they handed us out little lighters of the truck. You know, yeah. you know that was their promo thing. And pretty much the whole audience is like, oh, they're making another one. Why? Like, that was the general consensus. But then... I, you know, the cast came out and, and they showed us the highway sequence mm-hmm. yeah. and one of the kills. And I mean, it could not have turned it given a 180 to that audience. Like yeah. everybody was just so pumped after that. And I thought it was a really smart way to tie the threads of the first one up. Like it wasn't just another thing. And that's, you know, that's part of the thing. Three and four are fine, but I love that two and five tie directly into the first one. Like right. those are the horror sequels I love. Well, that's what I had fun doing. It's like, because I got to do what, like, because, you know, I wanted to set up where you thought that, you thought that, um, you know, um, 
Oh, crap. Her name was Kimberly in my treatment. Oh, Kimberly. No, it is Kimberly. <laughs> in the original movie, her name was Kimberly, but we use the name in the sequel. Um, you, would, you thought Kimberly and her friends were going to be the leads. And so, you know, I kind of set that up and then I killed off all of her friends. And yeah. then you bring in the other people and then you bring back Allie Larder from the first one. And then you. So it was fun to like do a sequel that kind of turned some of the expectations on its head, but also took the mythology a step further. And you realized that they were all connected to the f- people's fate in the first film. So. Um, I actually really love the second one's my actually my favorite. Me too. Um, I love too. <laughs> I love in the log truck thing. Like originally, it was going to be a hotel fire, and Craig kept saying, "Dude, we got to come up with something better than a hotel fire." And I was uh-huh. at home in Kentucky, and I got behind a log truck, and I you know <laughs> just moved over because I always do. And I just pulled off the road. I called Craig. I'm like, "What about a friggin'?" Lo-? I almost said effing. Yeah. You can. Um, you oh, can. Okay. Well, it's not clear here. Yeah. Almost <laughs> said, a, "What about a fucking log truck?" It's like that's great. And, and now it's a meme. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Like going it's through it's meme. Yeah, no, and it's certainly true. Like even now, um, if I get behind it, it doesn't even have to be logs, but like if somebody's hauling coal or because um, I see that in Virginia um, or if somebody's hauling um, just rebar or something like yeah. that, I immediately picture it coming off of the truck in front of me towards me. Yeah. Becca, and it's I, only from that movie. Right now I'm imagining you falling face first into your microphone and then your glasses rebounding onto my face and then I'm just like, it's <laughs> all playing. You're going to flatter and, and getting... somehow <laughs> these shards of my glasses are I'm literally going to take my, your head off. I'm going to fall off my chair. Yeah. I'm going to knock it <laughs> to Jeffrey. Jeffrey's going to roll under. Well, my favorite bit from from that highway sequence is is um, when somebody's got, I guess, a bottle or something and it drops behind the brake and they go, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. Goes to the brake or so when we were leaving Fangora, it was with my friend Jay, and they just did that preview. And we're like, wow, that was pretty great. We're in the car, and he dropped his Snapple bottle, and we were both quiet for a second. He's like, I'm just going to pick that up. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> please. When I saw it, the funny thing out of that entire sequence is you have a motorcyclist, you know? Oh, yeah. man. And the oh, funny yeah. thing is, everybody. Everybody played it out like beat by beat. They're all like, "Oh, ah, oh!" The motorcycle, my motorcyclist goes through whatever he goes through. And everybody's like, "Yeah, that's what you get, fucker. You don't drive a, don't ride a motorcycle." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, wow." <laughs> we no this, love for the motorcycles like, at all. <laughs> uh, well, let me ask you because obviously that became it's a, you know a series of films. Yeah. How, how involved were you post the first one? You got to write the second one. Story for the second Story. one, and you know, and and Craig and I, Craig Perry, the pr- producer who I. Friggin' Adore is one of Who them. Who was on Killer POV. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of our most he's dedicated listeners. Yeah. 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 He's yeah. A, well, well, if he's a dedicated listener, then I have to he's say gonna hear nicer things yeah. about him. <laughs> no, but he really is. He's creatively, he's one of the smartest producers I've ever dealt with. Mm-hmm. And he's just very respectful and, and a horror fan. Um, so, I mean, we've we've obviously talked about all the sequels and stuff like that. And, and you know, I you know I knew about five. And I knew what was going to happen with, with five. And, you know, so we, we stay in touch. But, you know, uh, so the second one was the last one that I had, like, super input into. Do you feel, is it, because it's, you know, you gave birth to something, do you feel like it's your baby, though, even when it's three and four and you're not involved and then you're watching them on a screen in a theater? Are you are you feeling the decisions being made a little bit? Is it hard to see the the idea keep changing or No, fun? I mean, th- I think that was probably the best part of working at a studio is I learned early on that decisions weren't, ob- weren't often based on yeah. creative stuff, but, mm-hmm. like, business stuff. Um so I learned to separate pretty early on. Like, I, I think, you know, there's a way to write creatively and be business savvy as well. Um, but I'm not super precious about stuff. If, if, it gets, if it makes it better, I think that part of that's having a theater background. Mm. And, you know, like it's the whole ensemble, and you know, the crew is just as important as the cast. And so um, as long as things get better, I'm, I'm fine with it. Well, I feel like every franchise, every good franchise has a face. Wes mm-hmm. Craven, Nightmare on Elm Street, Sean Cunningham, Friday the 13th. Uh, James Wan and Lee Wanell for Saw. Yeah. And I feel like you, you know, re- even though you, you kind of stepped away after part two, when you look at the franchise as a whole, it all comes back to you. So, mm-hmm. you know, I kind think of you were. Yeah, no, it's, it's <laughs> like that. I mean, I always say that just just even as a horror fan, yeah. um, you know, if if nothing else would ever get made, I'm I'm happy that something that I started did make an impact on the genre. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I'm, you know, just because I'm a fan, you know, so I'm like, I can't ever... I mean, I could complain. But. I think we've argued this before, but I mean, I think uh, we talk about the different franchises. But if you look at numbers like one to five, it's definitely one of the strongest and most consistent. Even the weak spots, the story idea is so consistent among the films. It's definitely one of the franchises that holds up the best 
over all its films. I think we've talked about this before, yeah. maybe when Craig was on, because it's so hard to do that. Usually things get so ridiculous and they can never it bring it back. One. And it has one. Yeah, it has one. It does. One, just but... like the, the quality control and even Craig, yeah. you know, Craig and will admit it, you know, the quality control dipped yeah. significantly, you know, but it got back up on its feet. The good thing is I mean. it went out. It, it, it rebounded yeah. significantly, yeah. which oh. you don't usually see, especially around, you know, once you get up to part five, to right. see like such a significant rebound is it's epic. Well, I think it could be one of the best, 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 uh, part fives ever. Well, you know what I think. I would agree with that. I, the reason I think that part five is is so good is is it felt like they made it for the fans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And you know, part four was was a, you know they had to rush it out because of the strike and you know they just didn't have time to put the TLC into it and I think because it did so well they were like oh man we got to step up our game for the fifth one and I just felt like they made the fifth one for the fans. Yeah. So. Did I, they I, know that five was closed because obviously story wise five closes the circle back to what you know your creations, which is awesome, and that's one of the reasons it's so good. But did they, I, uh, did they think at the time that that was closing the franchise at the moment of making that, or were they hoping that it would still? Um, I I don't know if they I don't know how they I don't know how they thought to be honest. Yeah. Like I think it was just it was a cool way to bring everything full circle. Yeah. Um, but you know the movie still did really well, so they. They can always do another one, but um, I, it's just interesting about where where to take it because you don't necessarily since you've kind of brought everything full circle, you don't want to just make the same movie again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but then also you don't want it to go too far away from the DNA uh, final right. destination. So, um, you know, but but if they don't make any more, I think five was was such a great way to go out. Like it's like all right, cool. Did mm-hmm. you have uh, in those years in between after leaving with two after two? Did you have many uh, pitch book ideas of things you would have kills or ideas you would have done had you were um, still in that world? Because I'd love to. Know. Yeah, yeah. No, you know what? I sometimes I would just walk around and yeah. see things and be like, oh, that would be fun or that would be fun. But I kind of wanted to figure out some other stuff to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was always like, oh, I'd love to do another final session, but kind of if we kind of rebooted it and went yeah. in a little bit of a different direction. Because um, again, I just feel like it did such a great job at what it was. Yeah. Um, and again, I think it went out on such a high note. Well, that was a thing. About, I think the the beauty of the Final Destination franchise was to somehow interconnect, you know, yeah. uh, and making it all come together in some weird warped way. Like you never, when Type 2 came out, I was like, oh God, it's just a rehash. It's going to be a rehash. It's just death after new people. And then it was like, oh, tying it into the first movie and then the third and the fourth. And it's like, I think that was very smartly done. Um, and a little bit of ahead of its time because I think Saul was felt the same way. Mm-hmm, Saul, yeah. they just kind of started building it and building it and building the mythologies that went went along. So. But it also gets more complex in that regard. Like yeah, that was yeah, one of the yeah. things that killed me with Saw is by the time it was getting to the later ones, I well, was final, like, oh. yeah, Final Destination wasn't a dis- dissertation on the housing crisis <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or the med- med- medical care system they uh, that Saw had. <laughs> yeah, Jeffrey, what does Final de- what does Destination it? say about uh, America? It just says we're all connected. And, um, <laughs> What would it say today? <laughs> it still says we're all connected. But okay. You can't cheat death. <laughs> okay, I'm bringing this up for a very specific reason. This will be painless, don't worry. Oh, uh, there's, and, and I'm, I trust me, you okay. can bring anything well, up. Well, the reason there's I no want to bring this anywhere. up is because it's, it's, it's an interesting insight into how the business works and especially when you're tackling a known property. But you wrote the 2008 remake of Day of the Dead. Yes which is my favorite George Romero movie. And it's directed by Steve Miner, who you know, obviously he's done, we've been talking to him a lot yeah, because of lot. House and Lake Placid and all that stuff. Um, but you know what? The, the thing that fascinated me is uh, because you've been very vocal online and, and put your original script out and stuff like that. What, what fascinates me about this for our listeners to think about is, you know, you grew up as a huge horror fan and you get asked to do this property that's very well known and that you love and there's there's the pros and cons to it because i remember i think it was william butler who is an actor ended up writing return living dead four and five Mm -hmm. and he is the first to admit that they're terrible terrible movies but (laughs) but he's like look they're gonna make return living dead four or five with or without me and i just felt as a fan like well i'm gonna try my bit damnedest right to hope they get it right so was it a similar situation for you or like how did, Absolutely. How no, did, they you know. had um they'd already hired Steve Miner mm-hmm. and they were going to make the movie and so they said come in and pitch for us. So I went in and I pitched an idea that was very structurally and character-wise faithful to the original but it was just updated. Mm-hmm. Um and so they hired me to write the script and I'm you know I, I was the same way I'm like they're going to make it one way or the other. Right. And I said look we're going to get reamed for doing this regardless of how good it is but let's at least try to be faithful to the original. 
And then once I got hired onto it, then they started like cha- changing stuff and changing it and changing it and changing it. And so it's, it got to be a very frustrating process. And I'm just, you know, and, and again, I've, I've written some crap, you know what I'm saying? So on my own, not like remake stuff, but, but it's, but I've written some great stuff. And then re- again, originally my story was one, I think the fans would have appreciated a lot more than, mm. than the film that came, that we ended up with. And by the end of it, I was just like, why don't we just change the name? Cause we're really going to get slaughtered because it's, it's a fun movie. Yeah, um, if it was a different just, if it was zombie a different, movie. Yeah. It was a different zombie movie. And so it's like with the sped up zombies and this guy is zombie on the ceiling. And all, like, so there was just so much stuff that I'm, I was just getting so frustrated. I had my, literally had my agent calling them saying that I could not do any more changes on it. Cause I'm like, you guys are going to like kill me with this thing. <laughs> um, and, when, and when you say they, are you referring to producers or the studio and stuff? And how does that differ from what you learned at New Line? Because this is a different company. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, well, I was a work for hire mm-hmm. on Day of the Dead. So I kind of basically had to do, you know, what I was told on that one. And, um, yeah, so it's it's like, you know, you do it or we'll just bring somebody else on to do it. And I'm not going to be like, you know. So did it eventually become like a movie by committee where like 20 different people had control and voice in it? Um, yeah, there was like the, there was like the producer team, you know, and they, yeah, they just kept making me change stuff. And they were like, well, let's, you know, there was a, because it, like in their, you know, in the script, like Mina Savari and those people were supposed to be reservists from this town. Um, mm-hmm. to, and, and so they changed, they took that out. So now it looks like they're supposed to be like army. Um, and they were like, at one point they were like, well, let's make the brother and the kids like, cause I wanted to start off where you thought it, like I did with Final Destination 2. I wanted to start off with some teenagers where you're like, oh, this is going to be a dumb teenager movie. And then you bring in all the adults. Um, but then they wanted more teenagers. And at one point they were like, well, why don't we make them 13? I'm like, mm-hmm. because they run around with rifles and machetes killing zombies. Like. <laughs> Mm. And they couldn't, that's going to be ridiculous. And they're like, well, just try it. I'm like, that's not going to, just make them 13. I'm like, you know, it's all right. It's 13. <laughs> so it's just like one of those situations where, um, you know, at, again, at the, at the end of the day, it's, it's a tough thing because it's like, you know, you get paid for a job. I, I got to work with Steve Miner, who I was a huge fan of. Like, so that was, that was the deciding factor, honestly. It was like, okay, I get to work with Steve Miner and I know I'm going to get reamed out for it, but I'll try to make the best movie possible didn't quite turn out like I wanted it to. Um, was he good in development to work with, or did, was it like it's hard, hard to? He had thoughts on uh, what he wanted it to be, and um, and I was more. I think I was more concerned with what the fans wanted, mm. and you know. So and he, but he had his own vision of what he wanted the movie to be. Is that so. before or after Twenty Eight Days? It's after, right? Twi- it was, zombies yeah. were already running around by then. Oh, yeah, yeah. Zombies, exactly. I, the the re kind of redux of the zombie yeah. thing was kind of kicked had, off yeah, by we 28 had, Days. Yeah, yeah. We had Dawn had already had Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, remake. Dawn. Yeah. I actually drove you down to the premiere. Oh, yeah. yeah. Of which one? Dawn Day of the, the Dead. Day of the Dead, really? And now, now Ryan's like, if I'd have known what you were going to do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, th- you. I think that was a conversation we had on the way down. <laughs> oh, did <laughs> we talk about I think, I think you actually said it. You said to me on the, on the way down, you were like, Ryan, what if you don't like it? And I was like, are you going to give me a ride back? And I was like, of course, Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty yeah. funny. Um, well, uh, but we're, we're going to do a topic with you in a little bit. But before oh, yeah, we, we, we jump into that, um, I want to talk about Dead Awake, which is your latest yeah. film. And what's interesting is this is this is an idea. You did a short film about this as well, Sleep Paralysis, yeah. mm-hmm. which is something that I occasionally suffer from too. Which sounds and, terrifying. Yeah, and, is, no, and they is. haven't really tapped this for yeah. movies yet. Um, that so, documentary, Nightmare. Nightmare. It's just called Nightmare. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. terrifying, just the yeah. idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was – that was a good. So, was, is this something you suffer from too? Is that I don't where? suffer. I, I wish I had some cool <laughs> stories about it. Um, just because you know, uh, I should just make one up. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, always yeah. like, you I'm, should I'm, start lying. Like, yeah, you on. should be like, I honest. was five years right. old. <laughs> after Day of the Dead, I started <laughs> suffering. <from> after Day of the Dead, sleep paralysis. <laughs> but no, but somebody brought me research on it, and um, I realized how prevalent it was, and I saw how far back the mythology went on it, and. Um, you know, for me, it was kind of cool because it's like, all right, this is a chance to kind of play with like reality bending and kind of have a play in that Nightmare on Elm Street kind of world, but mm-hmm. with sleep paralysis. Um, so yeah, it was a fun, it was a fun project. I mean, I, it, it turned out good. It, I think it's got some, you know, there were con- some constraints with budget and, and stuff that we had to sacrifice, unfortunately. Um, but I, I still think it's a really solid movie and it's a fun movie. And um, you got to act in it. And I, oh, oh, you, oh that's and, awesome. You got a little bit part of it. I have, yeah, but it, well, on the DVD, there's a whole scene. There was a, yeah, there's a party scene at the beginning. <laughs> um, and so there's, there's a couple of funny bits from the party scene that they had to cut um, that will be on the DVD Blu-ray. So. Right. Well, here's what I love about it is you've got Jocelyn Donahue in it. 
who I love. Yeah. You got Brie Grant, Brie Grant, who I also love. love. Oh, yeah. But I didn't know that Jocelyn plays twins in this. Oh, wow. Mm. And I thought that was super impressive right. that she got to play both roles. Yeah. You know? And a lot of people didn't, a lot of people did not realize it was her in both Doing roles. Both. They thought she might have they a They thought twin. she was two, or they thought it was two actresses. I wow. think she did a really good job. Yeah. Really no, good she's job really great. And Jesse Bradford is amazing. He's, gonna he's a really good actor. Um, we had Lori Petty, we had Jesse Borrego from Fame. Um, the original fame, um, <laughs> so it's just cool, you know. We had a, we got a, had a very cool cast, and that's and, on VOD now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I just rented that's, it myself. That's, that's, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's out there. And um, did was there any thought of you potentially directing it as well, or um, not Dead Awake? I am um, right now. I'm, I've got a, like kind of three things I'm circling. One is a Good Samaritan feature okay. based on Which my is short. A short, yeah. Mm-hmm. That you did. And um, is that short available online for people to see? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, okay, good. Just Google, like, Good yeah. Samaritan Jeffrey Reddick. Yeah. And, um, and I basically took a character from the feature and wrote a short around him. So I didn't want to, like, just shoot a scene from the movie. Um, but, yeah, we're working on getting financing with that. I'm working with um, Andrew Vandenhouten, a producer mm-hmm. that, you mm-hmm. know, really great producer. Um, I have another project called The Horror Show um, that's that's – A remake? No, no, no. Of the horror <laughs> show? Not no, House 3? It's, no, it's very – you know, Jenky Returns? <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing I love about the horror show is I think it's probably the purest like Jeffrey Reddick product you'll see because it's it's about a director who can manipulate reality through film. And so he brings these people's nightmares to life in this town. So it's very Nightmare on Elm Street meets Stephen King. Hmm. Um, and I've I, people have offered to buy it for like a decade, but they wanted me to make them all teenagers and – Right now, it's like we have three teenagers, but then we have an elderly couple, and then we have a single mother who's in her 30s. And mm. that's what I wanted is that Stephen King vibe of seeing these different segments of this community mm. and what their individual nightmares and fears were. Um, and so I just refused to like turn them into t- – make them teenagers. And so we're working on that right now. We've got Monique attached, which just cracks mm. me up because I'm, I want a cast that you don't think horror when we get them. Um, so we're putting that together right now. And then I have a, another project that – a I'm working on with this Indian uh, distributor that, that this company that actually distributed uh, Dead Awake in India. I went mm. down there for the uh, some press on that and for yeah. the first horror festival and um, um, met a really awesome producer who's interested in doing one of my films. So um, those are the three. I've got three. So three things I'm going to hopefully end up directing. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know if that was a natural evolution or something you wanted to do was delve into directing. Now. Yeah, it 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 is after because I, you know when you write stuff you obviously visualize it in your head mm-hmm. and. I th- I think after a certain point you do get you get to a point where you're like you want your vision mm-hmm. you know so that that way if it succeeds or fails like it's all on you yeah. like you know what I'm saying not that you ever blame anybody for anything but you know if you you know you just want to feel like all right this is me up there on screen and and if people like it they like it if they don't they don't mm. and yeah I can't hide behind a producer or a director or an actor or an actress or you know some imaginary person that I blame you know. I can't let you leave the room without because uh, Becca was already talking about it off, oh, yeah. off air, but off because air. it me- meant a lot to me. And I, I just a couple of years ago, I, f- I discovered that movie, Soul Survivor from '83, which is Tom Eberhardt who made Night of the Comet, and it's a movie I instantly kind of fell in love with, mostly because it was after it follows, and it has this heavy it follows vibe, but it also has like a little bit of Final Destination set yeah. up, like things going to kill kill you. And so I, I always just said, even if there's not much of an answer here, I wanted to ask if you had even seen it or remembered or, or knew of this film. Oh no, actually, I, I did see it, and it's funny because. Um, you know, because people that some people are like, oh, he just ripped off Soul Survivor, and some people are like, oh, he ripped off some Twilight Zone. I haven't seen yeah. the Twilight Zone episode; they're twenty two or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I mean, I watched every every single thing growing up, so yeah, it's yeah. like, and you know, you absorb these movies, and I okay. remember, I remember Soul Survivor, I remember being very creepy, but um, I never thought about like making a movie out of it. It's I actually read an article about a woman who changed flights when she was on vacation because her mother's like, I have a bad feeling about the flight you're on, and the plane went down. And this was like when I was, you know, in my 20s. And that got me thinking about cheating death. And then when I started to think of an, try to think of something for an X-Files episode, I'm like, oh, well, that premoni- that would be a really cool opening for an X-Files episode. Um, and, and so then I, you know, but in my X-Files script, actually, you find out that be- basically death took over somebody. Like there's a sheriff who's investigating the, the death because it looks like Scully's brother's killing all these right. people. Um, and you basically find out that the sheriff that's been investigating with him flatlined. He got shot and flatlined at the same time the plane went down. So death kind of went into him. Mm, and yeah. the sheriff was like killing these people off. So that it originally started off as more slashery. Mm. And then when mm. I went to the feature version, it's like, well, let's just do death. You yeah. Know? yeah. 
It's interesting. Yeah, no, and we can got to get David Robert Mitchell next because I feel like his <laughs> is even more influenced by Soul Survivor than yours. <laughs> He's he next on my target. <laughs> nice. Damn, Elric. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, Ryan came up with a fun topic that, you know, cause it, obviously it's that time. Yeah. yeah I just you're... figured it was, uh, it's summer movie season and you know, and it's 80 degrees in this room. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so let's be brief here, summer. guys. Let's do this Dying quickly. Here, guys. Uh, I can't last too much longer in this heat. <laughs> well, I mean, the whole thing is, is like, you know, you always hear from horror fans. Oh my gosh. Why isn't it? Why aren't they releasing this film in the, in the, in the fall? Why aren't they releasing this film in October? Why isn't this film coming out the week of Halloween? But that's just not the nature of the business. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you look historically, Historically, a lot of the ma- uh, major horror films um, of you know our generation came out during the summer, yeah. I, well, uh, summer I mean, movie season. Yeah, Jaws definitely kicked that well, off. Well, Jaws, created, the Omen, I believe. Yeah, The out. Omen was right afterwards. Yeah. Um, and so after that, you kind of it became the there's a horror film every summer. Yeah. For and, that, and that still stands. The Conjuring mm-hmm. was in a, was a summer yeah. horror, which movie. they actually bumped to make it the summer horror exactly. film because The Conjuring <laughs> was supposed to come out in April. Right. Yeah. Um, did, did The Conjuring bring that? That idea back, or no? I don't it's remember been going much along. Yeah, like See, I do, um, and I actually I, I went through um, like meticulously went through and looked at what came out in June, July, and August yeah. um, for like the past twenty years. Right. And some of the big ones that I found: Final Destination was two thousands. The Lost Boys was considered to be yeah. a summer horror film, nineteen eighty seven. Um, Event Horizon and Scream released back to back as um, like one was July and one was August. Scream? That's what it said. No, Scream was December. December. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Scream was December. Haunting, the uh, Yon DeBont's The Haunting Nightmare was a summer movie. Came out. Drag Nightmare Me to Hell. Um, yeah, so I mean Snakes like- Snakes on a it, Plane. It, yeah, Snakes on a Plane. It was always, it's always been consistent. Um, but, you know, just, you know, as a fun little, you know, kind of walk down memory lane, you know, I just wanted to kind of hear from you guys how you associate the summer movie season with horror. Because for me, growing up, it was always that time when school was off. And my VCR was getting plenty of love. Oh, and yeah, yeah, also, yeah. happy VCR day uh, at the time we're recording this, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is VCR day. On but, the Friday? Uh, no, oh, on Wednesday. On today. Oh, cool. Uh, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I mean, like, it was a time when the VCR got a lot of use. So there was a lot of films that I had seen uh, during the summer movie season. Lost Boys one, was one I caught on VHS. Monster Squad, I have very, very vivid memories of just watching that film over and over during uh, the summer that I had come out on a home video. Um, what was the other one? Uh, Maximum Overdrive. Right. Oh. <laughs> you know, uh, but, you know, for you guys, I mean, like, it, 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 are there films that kind of, now that we're into the thick of it, now that it's June, are there films that you guys tend to revisit? Because we do the exact same thing every October. We lay out, we go through our library and we put out all these films that make us feel good about October. You know, is there is there a certain ritual for you guys during the summer as well? Um, By the way, not not to sidetrack, but did I tell you what I'm doing this October? I've already decided months uh-oh. in advance. 31, 31 nights of horror anthologies. Oh, that's it. You know what? That's like watching. I'm do all horror like anthology films. There, there may be a <laughs> new gonna, one coming out it. around that time you're, for you're you to be check tired, out. Okay, tired, I, have, I got room. <laughs> but anyway, that's sorry. That's the ritual. So summer rituals. Or I, don't, summer I don't have movies? It's, a, it's, I got it's, it's both. on the table, guys. It's on the table. I mean, like you can do whatever, whatever you feel like, kind of gets you in the mood, or whatever you, you know. Fun do you have memories. one yet? Do you have a, a summer routine when it comes to horror? No, I mean, I, I just anything that comes out theatrically, I, I watch during the summer. But I, I you know, I. I'll watch movies in the background a lot when mm-hmm. I'm writing. So when I'm home, like I'll pop in Nightmare on Elm Street, obviously, or Suspiria, um, or Evil Dead. Like I just have a plethora, of, you know, like copycat for some reason. I got started watching it, <laughs> you know, recently just because I love the acting. But what do you, what, what do you I, like to wear while you watch this? Yeah. Um, <laughs> like what's your routine of what you're wearing? Elric, Elric wants to know. Well, I, well, I mean, like I tend, to, I tend to do a lot of summer camp horror movies. Like yeah. around this oh, time yeah. is That's when like, I start I think doing. slashers through and through. Yeah. Always oh, summer and through, slashers. Yeah. Slashers aren't my bag, so I definitely have a different list of summer films I mean, that I revisit. Friends? I know, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm much more monster, so I look to things like Lake Placid. Um, Piranha is always a big one. Was a summer movie. Yes, it was. was. Um, Piranha, Piranha, I watched on repeat during the summers when I was a kid. I still revisit it. Um, even in this one's, I, I wrote down ticks as well, um, just because, yeah, so you know, naturally. I got to stay on brand, guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the ones that I really recall, like, I loved Summer Camp Nightmare, was always I my I love that movie, yeah. and I'd love to see it again. I, I, I it have it. Years. I own it. I it's have the VHS. the VHS, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. It's Penelope Spheres, and it's much, I, I can't even say that it's structured like a horror film, even though that I think it presents itself 
is one. Um, but it's about a camp where all the counselors are just like really shitty people. And so all the campers mutiny and then it totally goes Lord of the Flies. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. And it was called the Butterfly Revolution on this poster. That's, that's the scary. that's the VHS yeah. Shit title. But yeah. that's but that's the VHS cover that I remember. <laughs> yeah, right. and that's it's Summer Camp Nightmare. It's the same cover there. Yeah. Um, but even and this one, I, I have a strange love for this movie. I love the ruins. And so that's one I that, that oh, a, yeah. I watched that a week ago. I was like, wow, this movie is still yeah, it's, yeah. it's really I gruesome. Really like that, and it's yeah. really gruesome. And you never see killer plants that aren't like Day of the Triffids. No, I think the so. ruins is a really strong movie. Yeah. Elric, was okay. there summer in New Zealand? What do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> we, we don't have Thanksgiving, but we, we we do still have summer. But that's weird because our summer uh, is, is Peter Christmas. Jackson stuff. No, it's Christmas. So all of our Christmas. And this know, is why I asked that question. Our summer. I mean, so it's what did strange. you purview during that time? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think it's much different. I mean, like my favorite horror films, actually, mo- most besides you know the thing, obviously, and snow. I love horror films set in really hot summer. I, I mean, I think it all goes back to Chainsaw because uh, you know yeah. you feel the heat in that movie. And yeah. You feel where they're driving to, and so for whatever reason, every time, and obviously the whole conceit of any summer camp movie is, or Friday Thirteen, anything is the fact that it's going to be taking place summer. Even though I think that franchise doesn't always do a great job of making it look like it's warm. Oh, yeah. I feel a couple of them yeah. look like they're actually shooting like off season, probably <laughs> because they probably are shooting off season because <laughs> you couldn't get the summer camp. Uh, but so I, I love. I mean, uh, first time I didn't see the burning when I was young. Yeah, that wasn't a that's, movie. That's I saw one of my go tos. I usually yeah, like to kick that's off like the a summer, later the one. Burning. And it's such a great summer movie. Like they really shoot it to feel like the ultimate summer yeah. camp. Summer I love film, sleepaway I camp. It's such Me a tra- oh, yeah. it's such a yeah. trashy. Like, it's almost, I mean, I hate to say this because it's almost like some pervert directed that movie we watch. Because <laughs> <Yeah. it. So laughs> the kids are all like, you know, Jonathan Tiersen, I know, and I know them yeah. both, but yeah, yeah. he's got the little tight shorts. They've all got their tight shorts on, and that uh, they're all sexual, and they're, they're obviously underage yeah. actors, mm. you know, and they're all like sexual, and that cook is like, oh, look at that chicken. And it's just oh, like, it's There's so yeah, much right. uncomfortable that, stuff in that movie. Look at those, oh, the baldies. Yeah. 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 Look at bald, yeah. Oh, it's like, man. Oh. But, it's, but it's so fun, like with the curling. It's just like, oh my God. So I, that movie, yeah. There's one, there's one. Do you guys like Stage Fright? No, I'm not talking about the Michelle Soavi one. But oh, yeah. The newer one, I love. The newer one. I still never like watched it. Su- she liked it. Yeah. I loved it's it. a summer camp for uh, uh, musicians, wannabe musicians. <laughs> yeah. So it's like a music ca- music camp for kids. But uh, it's very much in the vein of like a sleepaway camp mm-hmm. where it's just all these kids go to this music camp. And Did you do one theater the- camp? You'll totally get it. If you did I, theater did, camp. We didn't have theater camp. Oh. I was like, I'm hillbilly. Uh, okay. Yeah. We but had, there's basically a killer running around. And all the kids are usually sing, are singing all these songs, but the killer sings only heavy metal. So it's <laughs> very, very funny. Uh, Meatloaf plays the, the, the main counselor, the owner of the camp. But you should check it out. It's it fun. does some really cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have vivid memories of my first summer that I was at Fangoria. I started at Fangoria the prior December, but the summer of 2005 – um, was when House of Wax and Descent came out. And so I really oh, yeah. vividly remember going to press screenings of those and it being mm. really hot outside. Um, but speaking of films where you feel the heat, it's my second mention of The Sadist, this uh, yeah, episode. Yeah, that, that, you're right. Um, that. Where the, that is one of the films where like it just <laughs> feels hot and yeah. sweaty. I would have Predator 2, motherfucker. Predator 2. Predator Predator two. two. Yeah. I actually, no, I always make this joke and I, 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 that you have to launch summer with uh, Fulci Zombie because of the underwater fight yeah. scene. Because it's yeah. like, it just, oh, it's yeah. also, even though it's a tropical island kind of thing. It's, First it's, day of summer, I just put on <laughs> yeah. that, that music track, the little oh, yeah. tropical yeah. island mu- music track. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, anyways, that was just, I just wanted to kind of like, it, it, it's funny because a lot of horror fans don't discuss that kind of like the season with the with the genre. Well, it's still it. going on because like last year, Lights Out, I think was one of, and Don't Breathe, we're both summer sure, horror. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, we yeah, still yeah. have that. I prefer that. Well, what's the coming release up? dates don't interest me as much as like the, se- the shooting it in the season. I just love the way it looks on yeah. screen, like the sweat. and the you know, right. yeah, it's, I always enjoy that. I always like sweat. What's coming out this summer? <laughs> yes, I have a list of see, what are see summer list. horror films. Um, um, so we've mentioned it on the show already, but I'm really excited about it. 47 Meters Down is coming out June 16th. Yeah. On June 23rd, Elric and I have already geeked out over this one because oh, I yeah. think we both were huge fans of the original, Plenty The Beguiled. Yeah, um, oh, yeah. Which I can't say if it's going to be a horror film, but the original, it doesn't, <clears throat> it's got tense. tones. It'll be tense. Yeah, it'll be it's, it's sure. Um And Sophia Coppola is already she winning awards for this. Yeah. Con. So um, I'm psyched to see how this one plays out. Um, Amityville? No. no. They just, oh, just bumped bump that again. This, this week they just bumped it. Just Got it. So then we, will, guys. then we will move on Science to uh, 
we will we will slide past that and move very casually and easily on to Dark Tower, which comes out July 28th. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty pumped uh, for that. Wait, yeah. when does it come out? Does it come out in there. September? Oh, okay. you're, you're rushing me Oh, here. well, that's not really summer, I guess, yeah. I, I included it here. So yeah, yeah, Annabelle yeah. is August 11th. Oh. Yeah, Annabelle 2. Okay. Sorry, Annabelle 2. And just in time for all of your back-to-school um, fun Labor Day weekend and everything, we've got it on September 8th, and I think that will cap I'm the summer. I'm so looking forward to yeah, that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. For, uh, God, that looks I, so good. Yeah, I'm so curious about it. And that's the one that feels the most, of the ones you just read, that's the one where I'm thinking, ooh, summer, you know? Yeah, that's yeah. the kids. Summer. Even though Annabelle 2, I think, is going to be badass. I think, I bet he's going to knock that out of the park. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Wow. All right. Very cool. Wow, summer. Cool. I'll, throw, I'll throw out uh, Madman. Basically yeah. anything that takes place at a with a, anything that opens with a campfire, uh, yeah, tale. Uh, <laughs> is usually tale, a, yeah. a great summer movie, a horror movie. So, yeah, yeah, the yeah pretty, is that what is that vinegar syndrome? Which one, Mad Madman? Oh God, I have to double check. I thought it was well. Co- did Code Red do one? No, I, I, I'm Somebody pretty sure. Did, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's vinegar. I think it was like the big one they kind of launched with. But I feel like not enough people have seen that movie. I think that's one that people, if they haven't Mad seen Man? that, yeah, Madman. Oh. I feel like that's a. It's on either either Amazon or Shutter or it is. Netflix it is on now. One of so I gotta I gotta watch that because I. I you're right. It's Vinegar Syndrome, yeah. and I think Arrow did a release in the UK. Yeah, I'm sure okay. they did. And it could be Shutter or Amazon Prime. I know it's on one of the digital services. What about um, like Final Terror and Humongous? Oh yeah, I'm dating yeah. myself. Oh my yeah. gosh, no, no. Humongous, Humongous is so freaking just crazy. <laughs> That yeah, yeah. I remember seeing just, that be, just before dawn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Eden, Eden Lake was kind of cool. Like it's, I mean, it's pretty intense, but yeah. it's the British film. Eden, yeah, Eden Lake. Yeah. Man. What's the other slasher that Brian Collins loves a lot? Final Exam. Oh <laughs> Final yeah, exam is fun. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of British, Severance is kind of a nice, um, kind of that's summer horror movie. because like it's the movie. camping and yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was it's yeah. Yeah. That was a good yeah. movie. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's yeah. a clever film. Corporate retreat gone bad, but that one. What I was. I was a little bit bummed out about it. And it wears it on its sleeve. It's not a big reveal is that they're all just like terrorists or something like that. It's yeah, like it's it not a, it's of, not an actual slasher. It's just oh, it's some sort of like international thing. Well, and, and oh. Belko but, has uh, echoes of it, you know. Yeah. But I think Belko Belko yeah, might yeah. be a little more fun throughout. Yeah. yeah. Blumhouse plug. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm still allowed to do that. Uh, which other any of the fr- any of you the um, any of your franchise uh, Final Destinations set purely in summer? I don't. I think they're all kind of. Yeah, they it's, are. They're, they're all like they're they're, they're going in on school, spring break because they're always one. at like yeah. an amusement park or a racetrack. Yeah. yeah, they're pretty. Yeah. M- I think they're all summer kind of set yeah. movies. The they racetrack work. looks they work. hot. I remember that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. tonight I'm going to be watching Pool Party Massacre. Oh, oh yeah. Nice. Get me in the mood. Speaking I of summer. Just, uh, not summer, but I just got my copy of The Unholy from Vestron. Oh. So that's oh. what I'm watching tonight. I saw that. I watched that. That was on something that I watched that like in the last month and a half. It was, I think it was on, sh- I got Shudder and then I like yeah. went through all the movies and now like I've seen everything. <laughs> I really loved The Unholy when I was a kid and I literally have not fan. seen it since I was like 10 or 11. And um, we got into a discussion on the Shockwaves um, fan page about Religious, religious horror. horror. And then I was suddenly like, I just got this. I okay, watching it. Yeah. <laughs> it was long yeah. and handled well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, and if you don't know about it, plug that. It's good. We don't plug that in yeah, ever. Yeah, the but. Shockwaves Movie Club, which That's is on it. Facebook, and it's a group that was started by our listeners, Ryan Larson, uh, Dick Winchester, and uh, BJ Colangelo are the ones that kind of like moderate it. But and it's taken on the life it's of its own, so it's yeah. not just dedicated to the show. Obviously, it's just a hard but it's a pretty well, it's, polite. It's at the point where now people are yeah. like, hey, by the way, this is based on a show. Yeah, people yeah. keep forgetting. Like, there was one post where I was mentioning, somebody was like, yeah, I, I, I Becca mentioned this, and somebody wrote underneath, "Who's Becca?" And I was like, "Oh, <laughs> <Which is fine. laughs> it's that fine. Yeah, we're just Which glad to be we, there chatting. We encourage and it. shut just the fuck up, King. Like, occasionally, yeah. you know." Pump, pimp our show. This too. is yeah, almost great. a good loop to stepfather where she goes, which Becca am I here? I, who, am I here? who am I here? Mistress, yeah. Mistress, Becca. Mistress Becca. But they also have a book page that I've been getting really into because I've been um, reading more now that um, Strummer is actually like sleeping through the night. I'm like, I'm going to read now. I wish I can keep uh, up with reading. Yeah. So I'm, I'm Strummer's slowly... her husband if you don't follow. <laughs> He's now He's sleeping. He's sleeping through yeah. the night. Dave yeah. Strummer. <laughs> um, so yeah, but I'm getting back into reading so I've really been digging our book page as well. Well, nice. you know, I, I like to talk to a lot of people about this and you mentioned subscribing to show and stuff uh, you know how what what lately you know as somebody that's continually trying to find new stories to tell especially in the horror genre what are new horror movies that have excited you in the last couple of years or new filmmakers like you obviously keep up with this stuff yeah so, what I have mean, been some of your I mean, favorites I think of late? get out is just like hands down one of the mm-hmm. you know just a, such a great movie and dealing with a topic that could have been handled so on the nose in a completely off the nose way yeah so i think I think Jordan is like a, a really great new voice um, in the genre. Um, you know, I like um, I loved your next. Mm. You know, yeah. um, really, you know, I like Adam's work a lot. Um, 
oh man, so, I was thinking about this recently about some recent stuff, and now I'm, I'm blanking because I feel like I'm. But yeah, I mean, get out the big one. You yeah. know, I liked your mm-hmm. next. I liked. Um, oh, I liked um, Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Yeah. Oh yeah, I love that movie. Um, and who's the? I, I know his name, but the one that did Ouija too. That's doing everything. Like, Mike, Mike Flanagan. Flanagan. Yeah, yeah, like he's he's great. He's really talented. I so. love that's doing everything. No, he's doing everything. he is. So, <laughs> he is like every week. I'm like, oh, Mike's doing that too. Yeah. Wow. No, hush I just and- I'm not good with names when I put on the spot, but yeah, I think you know, he, I think he's a really good filmmaker. Um, yeah, yeah. There's nice. there's cool. some, a lot of good stuff out is there. Is there a subgenre you would like to tackle that you haven't yet? Um. I'm doing I'm doing my first slasher film, mm-hmm. um, which I'm really excited about. And it's actually the thing that really excites me about it is it's the cast is like 85, 90 percent African American Latino. Mm-hmm. So it just is like a Friday the Thirteenth or Scream, where the main characters just happen to be you know ethnic characters. Um, and that's been such a fight to do. Like I've tried to even just get like one African American lead in a movie since Final Destination Two, and it's like no, we can't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm glad that that has starting to change now. So. I'm excited to do my first slasher film because there's some really fun kills in there. And, um, you know, we'll see if, if my uh, Reaper character ends up becoming a Halloween costume or not. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> cool. Very cool. Jeffrey, thanks so much for coming in oh, and giving us your time. Me. Thanks, of course. Buddy. Really appreciate it. And uh, you guys listening at home, celebrate, watch a, watch one of his movies, A Final Destination. Yep. Oh, see ya. Thank, thank you. Thank you guys.